I call to order the regular business meeting of the Lakewood City Council on February 26th at, sorry, 7.05 p.m. To connect with the council meeting this evening, please use one of these links at lakewoodspeaks.org or lakewood.org slash council videos. For our attendees tonight that have visited us before, I'd like to first and foremost thank you all for your grace as we have continued to um, work towards conducting our meeting in the most efficient way, balancing hearing from the community and also conducting the business of the needs that um, need to be done for all the residents of our city. Part of that work um, will continue this evening as we're working on piloting different things as it relates to public comment, and that continues tonight. For those of you that are joining us online, um, how you will submit public comment this evening will be actually directly through lakewoodspeaks.org. Rather than calling in, we have kept lakewoodspeaks.org open all evening tonight, and actually it will be open through 10 a.m. tomorrow as well. For those of you that are here in person, I would welcome um, the, or invite you to also share in the opportunity to put in your public comment on lakewoodspeaks.org if you would like to in lieu of coming up in front of people, which I know can be intimidating, or if you feel like it gets too late, you don't want to stick around, this too, lakewoodspeaks.org, does end up being part of the public record for the meeting. In fact, it gives you the ability to say every single word you want to say right directly into the record. So feel free to take that opportunity for those of you in person as well. And with that, I, we will also actually probably pause the meeting just briefly um, one or two times as we go through this evening because Lakewood Speaks is actively open and because we are voting on issues this evening, we want to make sure that our counselors are all seeing the public comment, especially as it relates to those votes prior to voting this evening. So wanted to let you know a couple of new things that will be up. With that, I will hand it over to the clerk. Will the clerk please call the roll? Strom. Here. Over. Here. Mia Guerrero. Here. Stewart. Here. Ryan. Yes. Charizai. Here. Labura's absent. Nystrom. Here. Lowe. Here. Cruz. Here. And Sinks. Here. Mayor Strom, you have a quorum. All righty, thank you so much. And um, this evening we have a very unique and special opportunity and I want to extend that gratitude again to our new Councillor Nystrom for this fun idea. Um, many of you may know, or maybe you don't know, I'll explain. Last meeting we actually did not do a new member, new council member reception as we typically do. Um, we pushed it off to this evening per the idea of Councillor Nystrom and decided to open it up to some of the young people in our lives. So what we have this evening is a special induction ceremony as we are appointing um, some junior counselors for the night who will also stay with us to walk us through the Pledge of Allegiance and we will break for a brief reception to congratulate them as well as our new counselor, Councillor Nystrom. So with that, I will hand it over to the clerk for our induction ceremony. Thank you, Mayor. Can we have our junior council members please approach the podium? Just, just stand in the line. You want to be close enough to the microphone? Just a little bit closer. It's going to be okay. Okay. It's going to be okay. Okay. Um, Will you all raise your right hand? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read you your oath, and then you're going to say, I do, if you agree with the oath, okay? Do you, Arlo, Iggy, and Jordan, pledge to the best of your ability to act in a manner becoming of a junior council member and act in a way that upholds the welfare and best interests of the United States of America, the state of Colorado, and the city of Lakewood? Say, I do, if you do. I do. Excellent. Congratulations. I'll have you sign your oaths after you lead us uh, in the Pledge of Allegiance, okay? Go ahead and do that now, okay. right here. All right. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God,
Thank you, junior council members. Please come here and sign your oaths. Sign your name right there. You're going to sign it twice. Iggy, if you want to sign, you can go ahead and sign. That's, yep, you want to put your last name? You can. Um, if, if you want to, yeah. And then... Oh, that's my signature. I sign it right there. But there's... Yeah, coins. Sign it right here. Mayor Schramm, I think they're official now. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Mayor Strom, I move that we recess for a short reception to welcome Councillor Paula Nystrom and the junior council members. Second. Are there any objections to this motion? Seeing none, we will break for 15 minutes. That'll have us back at, what, 7.27.
All right, I call back to order the meeting of Lakewood City Council on February 26th. And with that, we'll start with our statement of conflict of interest. All members of the City Council have the responsibility to comply with the terms of 7.2 Prince B of the Charter and excuse themselves from voting on any matter in which they determine they have a personal, financial, or business interest. The City Council is empowered by Charter 7.2 Prins B to agree by unanimous vote, excluding the member at issue, to excuse any member of the Council from voting on a matter in which they determine such member has a personal, financial, or business interest. Will the clerk read into the record uh, item number seven, please? Item seven, resolution 2024-14. Endorsing the 2024-2025 Head Start grant application for the purpose of submitting a request to the federal government for grant funds available to provide Head Start and early Head Start programs for the final, final year of the five-year grant cycle and notifying the Office of Head Start that the city does not intend to apply for grant funds when the next five-year cycle begins. Okay, thank you. And I'll make note that we don't have anyone in chambers that signed up for public comment on this topic this evening. However, we do have a new public comment that's come in on Lakewood Speak, so we'll give counselors a second to review that. And then what we'll do is open the floor for a uh, motion. All right, you can go ahead and move. Okay. Mayor, I move for the adoption of resolution 2024-14. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. And with that, as we have no more public comment, um, we'll open that up for counselor questions and dialogue. Who would like to speak first? We've got Councillor Mayot Guerrero and then Councillor Sinks. Thank you. Um, I am very in favor of us reapplying for the, or continuing this program for this next year. And um, I worry about adding uh, that, uh, to be a part of the resolution that we need to say that we won't be trying to continue our program. I recognize that it is very likely that there's more cost effective ways to deliver these services to the people of Lakewood. Um, but I also think that we should give ourselves room to figure that out rather than keep it in the resolution. Um, and so I'm wondering if either anybody wants to speak to that, if staff want to speak to that, um, or if other comment or other counselors have sort of thoughts. But to me, I would be really interested in the idea of sort of via you know consensus to support the staff in that effort to explore the, these options to you know. Um, have a better understanding of kind of this lay of the land of, of what services will continue to be provided and how. Um, and in particular, the universal pre-K program is, um, I believe, funded for 10 hours a week is because it is really, it is the beginning of a program. So universal pre-K is a bit of a misnomer. I think there, there's a goal of it becoming universal pre-K and it's helping to support some gaps that folks feel either uh, because of a, a shortfall in Head Start funding or because of not qualifying for the Head Start program but still not really having enough money for um, like the full cost of preschool. And so those are all really important but it's the first year of the program. So I really worry about dedicating ourselves via a voted on resolution to that and would prefer, I think, to be able to have the resolution to continue this year and then give ourselves a little bit more flexibility, perhaps revisit this conversation even closer to the budget, given that that is what this really impacts. Deputy Manager, Mr. Goldstein, would you like to go ahead and introduce staff that's here? It sounded like we had some questions in there. Thank you, yeah. Mayor Strom. I'd like to ask Director Newland and Brent Bollinger to please come up. Sure. Um, 
Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council, for the opportunity to be before you tonight. Uh, I'll start with the Universal Preschool Program. So uh, that is funded. You can receive up to 15 hours of free child care. And then if you are um, income qualifying, then you could uh, uh, receive up to 30 hours of free child care. So anyone in our Head Start program would most likely be eligible for three, 30 hours of full um, child care. And our, to add to that, Kit Newland um, Community Resources. To add to that, um, our current program, I think Brent, correct me if I'm wrong, our current programs provide 30? A little over so. 30 hours. Most of our classrooms are 8 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. Um, and then we do have one with extended hours beyond that. And it's, I, would, I would turn to the city attorney on the question of pulling out a part of the resolution, the part about, I, I think that's totally fine um, if that was the choice that council wanted to make. Can I follow up, Mayor? I, I, do, I do just want to recognize, I, I do feel really supportive of, of if we're able to, like if we see how the program, the UPK goes in this first year, when as we sort of see the way that things unfold, I imagine that it will be very likely that it makes the most both financial and also just service providing sense for this to not be the city's responsibility. Um, and so I do just wanna say that I really, I recognize that and I appreciate that, that this is not a vote to try to get rid of Head Start. That's not what's happening for the people who are, are looking. Um, and so as long as you think you would still as staff also have like, the, the support and tools that you need um, going forward, like that this wouldn't leave you in a bad gray space, because I also don't want to do that unintentionally. It, yeah, and if I could, um, it's not necessarily that it would leave staff in a gray space. It's giving the Office of Head Start the time it needs to get that next provider in on board, because not only would it be universal preschool, but Lakewood Head Start would be opened up to other providers. And so the more time we can give them, the more likely it is that they'll have a provider in place to provide that service without any interruptions moving forward. And does that need to be in the resolution for that to be something that we can do? Uh, yes, as the city council, you would act as the governing body for Head Start. And so you would make that decision as to whether or not to continue. And so we have to have something approved by city council in order for that process to begin. Thank you. Councilor Sinks. Thank you, Mayor. So, yes, um, Councillor Mayotte Guerrero and I are on the Head Start Committee and we've met and I appreciated getting up to speed in that conversation that we had. And um, Head Start does such wonderful things, doesn't it? And yet, um, the city's part and the financial for serving fewer people, I think, um, for citizens that want to know our city staff being wise with our taxpayer dollars. This is an example, I believe, of how city staff is being very judicious. And um, so while Head Start is so great, maybe it's not the best use of city funds, especially knowing that Jefferson County has also has a Head Start program. Some people have also referred to the Universal PK, pre Universal Pre-Kindergarten, and um, they of course can pick up four-year-olds, but we have Early Head Start that also though picks up birth <laughs> to three to four. So it's not exactly overlapping, but again, um, I think all things considered, how many families are being served, how much it's costing the city, that this is a very good option not to just pull the rug right out today and say, no, let's get rid of it. No, it's a very humane, it'll, it'll help the staff a lot, whether they need to transition to another job or whatever. And um, so yeah, having that year preparation would be really good. And let me just check my notes here. Um, yeah, and also on that um, meeting that we had, so our, our Lakewood Head Start has had trouble staffing as well. So that's a consideration that I'm sure the staff, you know, considered when they said, yes, let's, um, let's move out of this after one year. And then, um, my final thought is that, so we have like, what, we have four 
sites for Lakewood Head Start. And they've also mentioned that um, one or two of our sites could be used, whether Jefferson County takes up, uh, Jefferson County Head Start takes up um, the slack that we might be causing or whatever. So all in all, what I'm saying is I, I think it's a very good plan and I'll be voting yes because um, it's, I, I think makes it just very clear for everyone which direction we're going. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Sharzai. Uh, yes, thank you. <clears throat> I, I appreciate all the context and the additional information. I know we had a, a, an additional discussion about this at an earlier meeting. Uh, I spent some time this morning on the Head Start um, like funding page just to understand what that process looked like and and I would agree and I feel persuaded to understand why we would consider making this amendment. I do agree with my uh, colleague uh, Councilor Mayot Guerrero though in removing would we consider removing this and notifying the office of Head Start that the city does not intend to apply for grant funds when the next five-year grant cycle begins as an amendment to that because in my understanding in reviewing the website, there should be typically in a Fed process for funding a letter of intent that would go out. And that seems like the appropriate time that we would signal to the Feds that we aren't intending on reapplying as opposed to prescribing it in this resolution. And since the NOFA, the notice of funding availability doesn't come out till next year, we have time if, if you know the stars align and we can fully staff this and it becomes incredibly easy for early childhood education you know i just would hate for us to put ourselves in a very prescriptive corner because um we we've, we've outlined that in the in the resolution here so i would love you know to keep that conversation going for that small amendment can i add a question to that the letter of instruction is that something or letter of interest sorry um, are you referring to the notice of award or? Um so typically, and I guess this is a question I have for you, when you apply for federal grants, you have, there's a process before you do that application where you send in a letter of intent that you are planning on applying. So that does give them some indication of how, you know, those, how many people are coming in with requests. And I imagine that that process is similar here. Is that different? It, it's possible. It might be different because we are in a non-competitive uh, situation where we've already received the funding and because we're in good standing with the Office of Head Start, we don't have to compete for those funds. So the only way another organization would be able to compete for those funds is if we said we did not choose to apply for those funds again right Just so that could be diff that could be the difference well and i'm understanding that we're agreeing that we want to finish out the final year of the grant mm -hmm. so that wouldn't apply here but instead of us saying in the in future years where we would have to compete we're saying at this point in this resolution we are opting out of that is that how i i should understand it correct so we're giving and and that really came from a conversation with our uh regional office who basically indicated that if you did decide to take that route, the more notice you can give, the better. So that's why it's in there for tonight, but respecting the fact that you can absolutely pull it, um, it just depends on how far down do you wanna make that decision and how close to then the next grant coming up do you wanna make that decision? Is it, uh, my understanding from the website, those notices of funding available, so the application for the next compete cycle that we would respond to wouldn't be out till January. So whether we do this now in February, or that, if we do- That I think, I don't have experience okay. with that particular process because we've never had to go through it. So I don't know if they would open it up sooner or if they'd open it up in January of 2025. That would be uh, something I would have to confirm. Okay, thank you. Councilor Cruz. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate the um, discussion so far from my fellow counselors and appreciate all of the, the context and, and work you all have put in with us, many of our questions. Um, just looking at some of the comments on, on Lakewood Speaks, I, am, I think there are many people who have benefited from this amazing program in our community. Um, and so I know we've kind of hinted at some of the context around why the city is considering making this decision, but would just love um, a little bit of a, a narrative of how we've gotten to this place of you know, Lakewood being a Head Start provider for what, almost 20 years, <laughs> um, uh, of why we're considering this um, so some folks can understand that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I would say that primarily staffing has been the big driver. 
there, there are two main drivers. One is the staffing situation, which has continued to be a challenge for us over the last four years. And the second is um, the general fund subsidy. And as you guys, you all have seen, it's, it has been reduced over the last few years, but that's because we're, we're not able to serve the number of families that we were before. So when we had more kids in the program, um, the subsidy is higher for the city. So um, there's been, you know, we've been asked to take a look across the board at how city general fund dollars are being spent. And we've done our due diligence and see that this is a per a per capita cost of very high compared to other programs that we provide. Not that it isn't extremely valuable because we recognize how valuable it is to the community, and this, the families that it serves as you indicated. Um, we just um, also want to look at ways that this program could be provided more efficiently because the, you know, the economies of scale that we can't we can't make with this small program. And I would just add one other thing about the timing. Um, the more time we provide to the families and the more time we provide to our Head Start staff and the more time we provide to the Head Start office, the more likely it is that there's time to get in a really uh, good fit provider that would step in and be able to make the transition smoother. So. Um, I would just encourage that if we do, if you all decide to, to wait a while to make this decision about continuing to offer that, we don't wait too long because the longer we wait, the more I think it becomes more and more challenging for everyone involved. So, which is why we wanted to, you know, provide this option to you to maybe make this the 24, 25 school year the last year. Hopefully that answers the question. Can I ask another question? Go ahead. Thanks. Um, yeah, thank you for providing that update and um, for also kind of some of the sensitivities around timing. I think that that's really important. Um, also, you know, for folks who might be concerned about, you know, because there is a lot of uncertainty, right, if we do forfeit kind of this grant going forward um, or, you know, choose not to be a Head Start provider anymore, um, can you walk us through a little bit of what your office and staff have have kind of thought through with regard to um, alternatives or other kinds of ways that some of the great facilities that we could, um, that we have could be used? Well, I'll start with offering some ideas of ways that we could support a new provider. Um, we, um, there's a variety of options depending on who, what a new provider would need. Uh, we want to be able to make this transition as smooth as possible for these families. So we could provide family support workers who would stay on as staff for a continuing period of time to help the families make that transition. Because <clears throat> as you all know, there's lots of resources that um, the Head Start staff provide on an ongoing basis to these families, including just as things as simple as diapers. So um, if we could keep, you know, we could offer to keep some support staff on. Um, with us for a while to help with the transition. Um, I think that would be something that would be really helpful. We could offer um, some additional um, indirect support, such as taking care of facilities both inside and out um, without charging a new provider. As far as where the how the facilities could be used, they could be used by another Head Start provider at little to no cost. And um, we, we also had thought perhaps Jefferson County Schools, the, pro the programs that they provide, could potentially use the schools as, as well. Since it's CDBG funding, you know, we have to be, we have to provide for uh, lower income families. James. Councilor Lowe. Thank you. Um, this is helpful and the, the materials you, you provided were helpful. There are a couple of questions that I, I, I just want to try to tease out here. Um, first, there is this question that's come up a couple times about the fact that there's now UPK available um, at up to 30 hours for lower income families. But based on all the, you know, the briefing materials you, you've provided and based on your recommendation, I, I assume you, you all do think there is some value to, there is value to Head Start above and beyond universal pre-K. I'm assuming perhaps in part because there is a shortage of, of child care in Colorado, notwithstanding the advent of universal pre-K and having this as a resource for families in Lakewood is very beneficial given that shortage. Is that is that a fair sort of summary of the case for keeping, for wanting 
Head Start period in the community, regardless of who provides it? Absolutely. We feel like Head Start is um, heads and tails above some of the other programs that are out there. Great. So given on the other side of the ledger, I mean, so given that, given that, that you all think there's, there's a value to Head Start in the community above and beyond universal pre-K, and I, I agree with that, um, uh, there's this question of, well, there's, there's this shortage of, of early childhood workers, and that's, a, that's clearly a challenge. That, of course, is a challenge nationally, and it's a challenge that's going to affect any provider, presumably, to some extent. So could I just ask you to tease, and you've already to some extent spoken, and I, I think the case is there, but could you just tease out, like, why is it that we think another provider, potentially, is going to be able to deliver this a little bit more efficiently or with more economies of scale or navigate the staffing shortage more than the city has than, than, than we've been able to over the last couple of years? Sure. Thank you, Councilor Lowe. Um, I think the, the big difference would be if there's an established provider that then takes on the Lakewood area, they've already got that infrastructure in place. They've got the management team in place. They have all the executive positions that make those um, management decisions for Head Start. And so more of the funding then can be directed into the classroom. There's a big challenge with early childhood education is the pay. Um, it just doesn't pay a, a self-sustaining wage. And so if you can redirect more of the funds directly into the classroom, that has the potential to attract more people into that field. So that's one of those, the reasons we've discussed this option. Got it. Um, so it, it, it seems like what, where, we're land, where, where your recommendation is landing, and this makes a great deal of sense to me, is that we want to keep Head Start in Lakewood, um, but that we think there's a, a strong case that uh, some sort of orderly transition to identify another provider or entity is going to be the most efficient way to ensure that Head Start continues. If, given that, if that's the strategy, if Council passes this resolution tonight, building on what Councilor Cruz asked, it would, I think, be very, very important to me, and I'm sensing maybe perhaps important other counselors from the tenor of their questions, that we do everything possible to sort of build that bridge and have an orderly transition, which I think would include whether it's the county that's going to apply or some other entity, um, doing quite a bit of work to, to sort of affirmatively identify the entity that's going to apply and then doing what we can to kind of basically support them in that application. So. If we pass this resolution, are, is, is that something that, that, that your team can prioritize over the next couple of months? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the ultimate decision will come down to the Office of Head Start, the federal government. So the city will not be able to play a role in that decision. But we can certainly notify the Office of Head Start of our support of different organizations that we would be interested in seeing assume that role. So I guess we're... What, I think where I'm coming down is this recommendation makes a lot of sense to me. I think it's very important that we do everything possible to continue Head Start in Lakewood. The question is how to do that. There's a persuasive case that sort of a, a transitioning to another provider would, would be the best way to do that. And so I, I think what I hear some of my co-counselors musing is, is it a better strategy to pass the resolution as is and clearly signal our desire to do that one year from now, or keep our options open because we're nervous that if we pass this resolution, the worst case scenario is we say we're not applying and then no one else steps forward that can do it, right? So one possible thing to, to consider, I wonder, you know, the, the, uh, the, the resolution says, um, and notifying the Office of Head Start that the city does not intend to apply for grant funds when the next five-year grant begins. I mean, one possible option to consider is we could amend that to say, notifying the Office of Head Start that the city does not intend to apply for grant funds when the next five-year grant begins, subject to finding a suitable other applicant that is willing to apply in Lakewood stead, right? We could, we could potentially add that to the, or some language like that to the resolution to, to signal that we, we aren't going to apply if someone else steps forward and can do it. Um, yes, I, I think the tricky part with that is the Office of Head Start won't release those funds and make it available to other organizations to apply until we've said we aren't going to. Right. So right. that's the only challenge to thread that needle. I see. So this, I mean, this is, this is a tough one, honestly, because it, I, I think it's a question between trying to clearly signal and, and clear the way and provide as much running room for another provider to step forward. But we're kind of rolling the dice a little bit if we do this. It, it, and and in, it, so 
I think maybe what I'm hearing from, from some of my co-counselors is we'd all feel more comfortable passing this once, once you all have some, some pretty firm intel that someone, the county or someone else, is prepared to apply. And, and then maybe that would be an optimal time to pass this resolution. I mean, does that seem like a reasonable strategy? Uh, I'm, yes, I just don't know that we would ever be able to provide that level of assurance um, with other organizations because, for instance, if it's the county, they've got to get approval from their board of commission, their county commissioners, um, nonprofits would have to get approval from their board. I just don't know. I, I think we have a pretty good understanding that there will be interest. It's just I don't know that I, we would ever be able to sit up here and definitively say, here's who's interested, here's like who would apply for those funds. I, I just don't know that. I don't have the confidence that we could give you what you're looking for at any point down the road. Um, if that if that helps, I don't know if that does. It might just complicate things. Just because, excuse me, just because of the way that the federal process works, we are not going to be privy to any of that information until we guarantee that we're not going to apply, and then Head Start goes through their bid and selection process. And once they've selected someone, then we're privy to the information. But it's really tricky. It's, it's extremely tricky. And it's totally understandable why this is such a tough decision because we all feel really strongly, and I know you all do too, that we, we don't want these families to be left without Head Start. It's really important that, there's, that, that somebody is continuing to provide that service. We just, our argument it would be that it's just, we're not the best people to provide that direct service, but we can provide all kinds of other support indirectly to the next provider um, so that hopefully the transition can be smooth for families. There's really no guarantee that we could give you, unfortunately. I, I guess one other addition I, can, that I thought of that just now is that let's say we pass this motion as is, um, and it goes out to bid and nobody does put a bid in to offer Head Start in Lakewood. With Jefferson County operating in the county already, they would then be able to open their borders to serve Lakewood, which they cannot do if there's a specific Lakewood provider. There's a set boundary limit, which is the city limit. So that's, I guess, another possible um, outcome is that if no one did provide Head Start in Lakewood specifically, the county then could open up and begin serving Lakewood families that they aren't able to serve right now. Just another thought. Okay, thank you. Councilor Ryan. This will be mercifully this will be mercifully brief because there's been so many excellent questions. I think you've addressed it. You know, the thing that gives me some comfort, I guess, is the indication from the city that we will do our utmost to support a new provider um, after this. And the other piece is that uh, the city has agreed that we will honor our commitment, our five-year commitment, and serving out this next year will will do so and i think that says a lot about the city to say that we're going to move forward um, <clears throat> i understand there's there's no no guarantees on uh, what what can happen and i think we all agree that head start is a is a good program and we know that there's other alternatives out there we don't know whether those alternatives will be any differently but i'm firmly in support of if we're going to make a decision, make it now and let others be able to step into, into the stead. And if no one's going to step in, then maybe we can do something later. But I think we need to give as much of a runway to others to serve. I have one question before we um, kick off our second round. So theoretically, I mean, economies of scale means a lot to me as far as, you know, trying to f be financially responsible with the general fund dollars. So that does weigh very, very heavy on me, but we also have, you know, families that are relying upon us for years of service that they've, you know, been through already and want to make sure we do a responsible transition. My, my question is, if we were to pass it as it is tonight, and in January no one is there, in Jefferson County didn't want to open it up. Can we come back and say, 
we want to try to meet this need again? I mean, can we come back if we find that there are no other providers that want to do this in our community? I, w I would have to confirm and get back to you with the uh, Office of Head Start if that is an option. Um, and then I can I can report back to you. I know that doesn't help the, the conversation tonight, um, but we have such a good relationship and a longstanding um, uh, commitment to the, the program, I would think that they would be open to that conversation because we've been in good standing for 20, 20 plus years of offering Head Start. Thank you. Um, Mayor Pro Tem Sharzai. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I, I think it, it's an important point that a few counselors have just brought up and the mayor's brought up is just this idea of like, can we come back? And that again goes to like, why make this so prescriptive? Like if we do think we need to go back to, if nobody steps up in this vacuum of provision for services, by having this explicitness in the resolution, we have then put ourselves in a position of having to get permission from the Department of Ed to come back after we've already stated explicitly that we wouldn't. And also, you know, I, I, we are rolling the dice. I think that's a really important point. You know, Jeffco could open up and serve us, but we, there's no guarantees. This money goes back into the federal pool. And there are other, you know, uh, big municipalities across the nation that would, I'm sure, love this reallocation of dollars. And so that doesn't, that doesn't necessarily mean that Jeffco is going to get more money to serve the kids in Lakewood that aren't being served. And so, again, I just feel like we've heard from a few folks, you know, are, can we keep this open? And, and it, that to me necessitates removal of that sentence that is saying explicitly we're not coming back. And, and there's lots of great reasons why we won't come back. And I, I just want to make sure that we have every opportunity to understand that these 40 families, it may feel small in the scale to us, but it means a lot to them. And I know, you know, having school aged children, how important that was to have access to early education. And so I just don't want to totally eliminate all options with such a prescriptive language in the resolution. Councillor Miat Guerrero. I have a sort of similar train of thought, and thank you, Mayor Storm. You asked the exact question I had as well of the like, how can we revisit this or ensure that if this gap is going to persist, which is what we're also worried about, that we can fix it? And so I'm actually, I have, a, I think, maybe a legal question, um, which is there is, so it's, there's some of this really final language dotted throughout the resolution, like, um, this, sorry, where did I lost it? This grant year represents the final year the city of Lakewood will serve as a direct provider of Head Start and early Head Start. Like that is, that mean, to me that resolution means that if we don't have a, another council vote on another resolution that, that undoes this, that even in five years from now, if we realize that we wanted to do this again, it would have to be, I mean, I guess it would maybe need to be anyway, but so my question is, sorry, I got a little rambly because there's like four places in the resolution where it says these things. So I apologize to our studio audience, but um, my question is legally, given that we are the governing body and so we need to indicate that yes, it is okay for you to communicate that we're not planning to continue this program. There's a part that feels a little bit softer um, that says, the city council hereby finds and determines that opening the Lakewood service area to other organizations interested in providing Head Start in Lakewood is in the best interest of the residents, which feels less final, like it would be less difficult to move forward on, say, a plan B if we needed to continue our Head Start program um, rather than the final year language or the language just before that. Um, that says that we are not going to be applying again. So I guess my question is like, can, can we have, can we leave that gray language and like would that legally give the staff enough um, authority to, to communicate with, the, with the, uh, the, the federal government, with the funders, with Jeffco to try to essentially just create a little bit more flexibility and a little bit more staff determinants in how they can move forward with these conversations? The way a resolution is crafted is it begins with the title 
following the title are what's called the recitals, and the recitals all start with whereas. And the recitals let people know the thinking behind a resolution. But those aren't the binding provisions. They're just letting people know what we're thinking as a city. The binding provisions always follow the language, now therefore be it resolved. There are three binding provisions. The first one that accepts the grant for the 2024-25 Head Start year. The second one, which uses the language that we need to use to notify the federal government that we are not intending uh, to continue the grant. Um, this is the language that, we're, that we need to use because it, we are non-competitive at this point. And they need to know we're being non-competitive. So that's, that's their language. The reason that the recital uses that softer language is because that's really what you're thinking. And, and a lot of times legal language is, is pretty stark, but people need to know the goal here is not to push Head Start out of the city. The goal is how can we find a provider who's better able to provide economies of scale, is better able to provide um, five classrooms and, and have all of the um, staff that the city has been searching for and as a small provider just can't bring in. So what it is the city and the city council wants to do is is reflected in the in the recital. The exact language in section two is the language we need to use. The other thing is what we're giving up is the right to be non-competitive for the uh, 2025 school year. There isn't a, a, I'm not aware of a provision that says that we're not allowed to put our hat back in the mm -hmm. ring, but what we're giving up is the right to be non-competitive. And, and, and that's, that's what the, the government needs to be notified of. Thank you. That, that last yeah. part that you just said, I just want to highlight was, that was very helpful of, that almost fully answers the question. Yeah, Sorry, I, I don't think, mean to I interrupt was say, you. I think that was, I was going to follow up and say, if in six months the council decided that they wanted to pursue it based on factors, we could bring a resolution back at that point saying we want to apply for the next five-year grant. So we would always have that option down the road once we have more information. This resolution is simply crafted to give the, the federal government, the Office of Head Start, the ability to put that feeler out there, put that bid out there to see who would apply. So we could always come back before you um, with another resolution if that's the intent of council down the road. Thank you. And then I have another question, if that's okay. Uh, my other question is, um, you know, you, you mentioned Jefferson County may choose to come into our borders if, if there's not a Lakewood specific provider. And I just wanted a little bit of clarity. When we use the word provider, I imagine there's not a lot of non-governmental entities that we're referring to. Like we're, we are thinking that Jefferson County is the most likely, or are the, is there like a long list of um, nonprofits that run Head Starts? What, who, yeah, who there, could providers be? There are quite a few providers in Colorado and in the Denver metro area. Whether, in fact, most are county or nonprofit run. It's pretty unique that a city would have a Head Start program. So. Um, there's a there's a statewide uh, body that would have probably a list of all the different providers, um, Colorado Head Start Association, that you could look and, and see all the different providers in Colorado. All right, Councilor Lowe. Um, honestly, I, this, I, maybe this question will will reveal my own ignorance about the process, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Why couldn't we defer the, the sort of this, de basically strike section two, defer this question of, of definitively saying that we're not going to apply, and then basically ask you all, ask staff to talk to Jefferson County or talk to other providers and ask them to, to, to sign a letter of intent to the city saying that if Lakewood were to relinquish its sort of non-competitive bid, that they, that they would intend to apply and have that approved by, in the case of the county, you know, the, the Jeffco commissioners or in the case of a nonprofit provider approved by their board. And then once with that assurance in hand, then you could come back to us and then we could sort of authorize section two. I know that adds a couple of steps and I don't like adding a couple of steps, but um, 
it, it, it does seem like we're all struggling with really not wanting to give up this, this non-competitive option to reapply for five years until we have a little more certainty that there's someone else waiting in the wings who's definitely ready to do it. We could definitely have some conversations with Jefferson County and potentially other providers and uh, make a verbal agreement. I, I don't think we could get without notifying the Office of Head Start that we're not going to apply again. We're not going to be able to get anything in writing or have the Board of County Commissioners sign off on it. But we could certainly have conversations with them and also with other. I think there, um, Brent had mentioned there's one in Littleton that has a pretty big service area as well. So that's another provider that we could potentially talk to. Is that realistic to, I mean, if not a written letter, at least sort of a, a form, a, a firm verbal commitment from either the county or from a nonprofit that, that they would want to go forward and then come back to us at that point? It's a possibility. Um, I don't know that it does exactly what we want to accomplish um, because we don't know for sure if that, you know, we make a verbal agreement, we don't know oh, well, something happened, for example. We have to make budget reductions. We're not going to sure. be able to do it, you know, that kind of thing. But we could certainly make efforts to try to get some kind of a commitment from somebody informally. We do, we, and it's true that we don't have that tonight. I mean, we, we don't. we've had conversations, but we don't have a firm commitment from any of these folks oh, no, that they would no. do that. We, we don't. Um, I'm honestly struggling with this a bit because I, I see the logic of just also clearly signaling, saying we're out, we need someone else to step forward and, and that provides you all more certainty. But it also does seem like a bit of a risk and it's a risk for 40 you know, low income families. So on, on balance, I find myself persuaded that we ought, it would be safer to hold off on that until we have a little bit more certainty that someone else is ready to step forward. Councillor Cruz. Thank you. Um, and also do like want to recognize in the same way that we, all of us are really deliberating with this. You know, I, I want to recognize, I know you all have really put a lot of thought into this um, and put a lot of care um, into this conversation and how it will best impact employees and families. So I um, just did really want to highlight that. Um, there are just two things. I am I am similarly struggling with this. I totally understand um, we want to say what we're going to do as soon as possible to provide that clarity. Also um, kind of understand what our escape hatches are are if things don't go as planned. So just two things I just wanted to really clarify. One, if Jefferson County were to serve Lakewood in the instance in which it's not opened up, you know, in Lakewood again, uh, would that include serving people at the facilities that we have or um, would they be kind of outside of the city and the facilities that they're already existing? Because I know location is a big concern for some folks. I, I think that would be up to the county to decide, but we would certainly offer our facilities for their use. Yeah. Great, that's helpful. And then just double tapping on something we just talked about, but it is your understanding that us passing this, revolution, this resolution does not preclude us from applying again. Correct, yeah, there would be nothing stopping us from applying again if we decided that's what we wanted to do as a city. Okay, so maybe, so the hesitation earlier was maybe like about how the Office of Head Start would feel about that, we're not sure, but we are within our rights to do that if we do forfeit this non-competitive grant. Okay. Councilor Sinks. Thank you. I just think as we step out of the non-competitive grant, Somebody stepping in would have a very sweet deal in front of them. And I don't know why, but my mindset is, well, of course somebody would jump at the chance. You know, they've got the facility, right, you know, for the taking. You know, we've done all this groundwork. And so, so I don't know why, but I'm not concerned about, oh, no, what if no one steps in? I, I think it's too sweet of a deal for anyone to pass up on. We're leaving a void that people can come in and how easy for Jefferson County Head Start to just move in. So I would like it to be settled tonight. My vote is still a yes, so. Thank you, Councillor Sinks. I would echo that personally, given that we're, we're not walking away completely, we're just saying we're taking our hat temporarily out of the ring with the option that we could put it back in, just it might be a competitive thing, but 
if that were the case, then that's you know kind of the ideal decision that we want to have in front of us anyway. Um, with that, a Councillor Nystrom. Um, would you be able to clarify for me if we elect not to pursue this going forward, um, I think someone referenced earlier, and the funds are released, are the funds earmarked in any way for Jefferson County or for the state of Colorado, or is there a potential that the funds would just not be accessible to us? Um, currently, the funds are earmarked for the Lakewood area, but once we relinquish the funds, the Office of Head Start guides the process. So that's really a, a conversation for them and a decision out of our hands. So, but right now, there are funds specifically set aside for Lakewood. So that's, that's the best I could do for you, I think. Okay. Can I add one possible point of clarification too, though? Because there are more than one bucket of funds. So we've talked about the federal dollars that are coming in for the program, but then there's also 500,000 $500, that we take out of our own general fund to you know, subsidize the right word to add to the program. So those funds are not earmarked. Those would go or remain in the general fund for us to you know, reallocate as we find necessary in other areas. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Is it possible within the uh, constraints of the contract that we could subcontract? Like, why wouldn't we keep our ability to be non competitive, ensuring that we receive the funding in the future, and then subcontract with the county? So we know, to Councillor Nystrom's point, there is no surety. Once we release this, it goes back into the Fed pool, and it could go to Detroit, it could go to Florida. Like, we have no guarantees there. So why wouldn't we just keep this and then subgrant it ourselves? You could. You would just lose that economies of scale we were talking about, because then we would still have to, you would still have to approve any and all decisions, and we would still have to have a management team operating that program. So the idea was to hopefully get a program provider that already had that in place so that more of the funds could go into the classroom and into the staff. But if you retain those funds, you still have to take care of all of the management component of the grant. And then that just would leave us in the same place we're in now. So you can certainly get a delegate agency to run the classroom portion of the program or run the program for you, but you have to retain that um, administrative costs for, the, for operating. And that couldn't be considered the cash match for the federal grant, like the amount of overhead support that we're providing? Um, we would be the direct recipient of the funds, so we would still have to provide the non-federal match. Um, the delegate agency is just simply brought on board to operate the, the classroom. So the city would still be responsible for any match because we would be receiving the funds. Okay, thank you. Councilor Mayor Guerrero. I think that based on what I've heard, and particularly based on Councilor Lowe's um, line of questioning, that we could, again, I recognize nothing would be even remotely legally binding, but just having more of the lay of the land, I think um, I admire Councilor Sink's viewpoint, um, but I feel more pessimistic, I think, about um, our systems and particularly our social systems and our social services that support the families here and like with that, that really need it most. Um, you know, we, we've, I think we've done a really good job as the city, even in other arenas, not just to head start of creating infrastructure because there's a lack of the of programs that are resources and supporting people at other levels and so again whether or not it's a, a fully firm commitment or even a handshake agreement or just conversations like we've we've scoped it out we called a few people there's likely to be interest i think that even that would be enough for me to say okay yes let's let's give the signal that we we are forfeiting our non-compete and um so i think because of that, I'm going to move, and then I have a legal question on this also, uh, just in terms of process, because I think what I need to do is move to remove section two, 
Um, I don't know if I then need to remove any of the whereas statements um, that sort of reflect section two. And then I also want to postpone this conversation um, to a date certain, given the timeline that makes sense to staff and what's possible. I don't want this to not be something that we don't get on the agenda in a really timely way, recognizing that this is, um, that the sooner the better. Right, so I would amend to remove just section two and then we would be able to pass the whole, the, the rest of it. And so my question is whether or not I'd need to remove any of the whereas's given that I'm getting rid of number two, but I, I don't think so. The recital clauses are not binding. Great. They just show the intent behind it. Um, however, I think it, it makes more sense if you do make the motion to remove the final recital and section two. Thank you. And then um, once we've done that, is there like a specific thing I need to do to make sure that we then revisit this conversation or is that we can just by consensus make sure it's on the calendar? That would be uh, by consensus make sure it's on the calendar. Okay, great. Um, so I am going to move to strike the final recital clause and section two of this resolution. Second. Any discussion? Councilor Ryan. I, I call question. Ah. Okay, so we have an amendment on the table. Councilor Ryan, you called the question? Are you calling the question on the first? On the amendment. I mean, it, the amendment's pending, so. As I understand it, the, there's an amendment pending, and I just want to end discussion. Okay. So, it was so we will then vote. And a yes vote means that we are removing section two. We are amending the resolution to remove section two. And the last recital clause. And the last recital clause. Mayor. First, you have to vote on the motion to call I, the question. I withdraw the motion. Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and vote on the resolution as amended, removing section two. Voting on just the amendment. Just the amendment. All right. We're just voting on the amendment. And that passes um, three nays being over, Ryan and Sinks. All right, so now we are voting on the resolution as amended, having removed section number two. <coughs> All right, and that passes um, nine yeas, one nay, the nay being Councillor Sinks. Councillor Mayotte Guerrero. So sorry, before we move on uh, to the next agenda item, I just wanted to check in on timing. If that's something that you all need time to discuss and then you'll let us know, that's totally fine with me, but I just wanted to make sure that that doesn't get lost. Staff, staff will need a little bit of time to figure out those conversations, um, but I do think within the next few months, the, the importance of getting word um, out quickly on this still remains, so there is urgency on staff's part to come back with you all at some point soon. Fabulous. Thank you so much. All right, moving on to this evening's consent agenda. Um, 
Again, thank you for your grace as we're changing up some processes as the way that the city council works. Um, I wanted to make one comment on the consent agenda, something tonight that you're not used to actually seeing. We have a new process in the way that we are calling special meetings that we're doing this to make sure that we are um, more full disclosure, transparency, letting the community know as soon as possible that we've got meetings coming up. So what you'll see in the consent agenda this evening that's new, if you're used to looking for it, is a request for special meetings. We've got two uh, executive sessions that are coming up that happen this year or this time every year. Those are um, performance reviews for our city manager as well as our city attorney. So those are in there this evening for consent agenda. Just a little bit of explanation for those of you that are wondering why you've never seen that before. So um, with that, we will go ahead and um, are there any consent agenda items that council would like to pull? All right. Well, with that, will the city clerk please read the consent agenda into the record? Thank you, Mayor. The consent agenda is comprised of the following items. Item 8, Resolution 2024-9, approving the 40 West Art Line Framework Plan as an, as an amendment to the Lakewood Comprehensive Plan. Item 9, Resolution 2024-10, adopting design standards and guidelines for the streetscapes, streetscapes, plural, and buildings for the 40 West Art Line. Item 10, Resolution 2024-11, Appointing a member to the budget and audit board. Item 11, resolution 2024-12. Appointing a member to the board of appeals. Item 12, resolution 2024-13. Appointing members to the, reappointing members, excuse me. Reappointing members to the Lakewood Advisory Commission. Item 13, approving minutes of the city council meetings for January 8th, or city council special meetings, January 8th, 2024, January 22nd, 2024, February 5th, 2024, and item 14, request for special city council meetings, uh, March 25th, 2024 at 6 p.m., April 8th, 2024 uh, at 6 p.m. All right, thank you very much. And I will note, I just checked um, Lakewood Speaks. I do not see any additional public comment in this space. We do have um, one community member that wishes to speak on the consent agenda, Natalie Minton. Good evening, City Council. Natalie Minton, Ward 5. I'm speaking regarding um, item number 10, the Budget and Audit Committee member. Um, first of all, with this appointee, um, could uh, we make it part of the public record? What is the ward this person lives in? And how long have they lived in Lakewood? Those are not present within the documentation that I spotted. And I myself am curious because I would like to see more taxpayer advocates on the budget and audit committee. I'm not sure I see that at this point in time. Transparency would be a great thing with the budget and audit committee. So now I've spoken about the member, but I'd like to speak about the budget committee, budget and audit committee. Although I tend to want to drop the word audit from it because I don't see where auditing has really specifically been done within this committee. My history um, is in auditing. As I served on eight years with RTD, I was used to dealing with an internal auditor. And we had a very independent committee, um, but our meetings were um, publicized, uh, recorded. Those things are not present in Lakewood. So I'm a little bit perplexed when I come from um, the RTD background and knowing the financial reports are presented to city council um, or in the governing body on a monthly basis. Um, there was public comment uh, available. I don't see these same things present. Um, and I, was the timer started, by the way? Just as it's been time expired the whole time I've been here. Ah, there, thank you. Um, so with that, what I would like to request is that first of all, we have somebody being appointed to this board. There's three members of the public, but we do not know how to contact them. Uh, and if they're to serve as our representative, I would hope that we'd be able to contact those board members. Secondly, there's no public comment during budget and audit committee, mem committee meetings. So between the fact that we have a, don't know how to contact the, the members, um, we don't have public comment, period. How is somebody supposed to weigh in? Now, it's evident from past minutes that Lakewood wants to 
lay the groundwork for another ballot issue to eliminate our taxpayers' Bill of Rights, perhaps on a permanent level. That's within the minutes found um, from June or last year. I, I would like to see where that has been laid out. Where's the committee? Where is the public able to chime in on this discussion? When we have staff members saying that they're going to bring in members from other communities to come into here and tell us how to frame a ballot message to take away Tabor refunds, I'm very disturbed. I think ultimately, to shorten us up with 10 seconds left, what we would be best off as citizens is to run a citizen initiative to amend our city charter and put in an elected auditor within the city of Lakewood. I hope you'll consider that because otherwise we could go out in signatures and get it done, but it's a little bit rough. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Menton. All right, can I have a motion for the consent agenda this evening? Mayor Strom, I move for the approval of the City Council minutes for adoption of resolutions and approval for request of special council meetings, all of which are included in the consent agenda items introduced into the record by the City Clerk. Second. And with that, I will go ahead and hand it over to uh, Mayor Pertem Sharazai as the chair also of our screening committee. Uh, yes, thank you. The, I wanted to just take a quick moment to thank all of the candidates. Uh, the screening committee is one of my uh, more favorite parts of this position, is just having an opportunity to meet so many um, members of our community are eager to step up and serve. And so we had a great pool of candidates for budget and audit, board of appeals, and excited to welcome Bobby Wolf um, to budget and audit this year. She did come with a stack of recommendations, so I'd let the public record show. Um, board of appeals, Mr. Jason Summers, and uh, congratulations to Sarah Griffin and Rena Fowler, both being reappointed to the Lakewood Advisory Commission. So thank you all for stepping up to serve. Do you have any other, any other counselors that would like to make comments on anything on the consent agenda? All right, ready for vote? That got easy. <laughs> All right, we'll go ahead and cast your votes on the consent agenda, please. And with that, we have um, that passes nine yeas, one nay, the nay being Councilor Over. Mm. And with that, that moves us on to item 15. Will the clerk please read item 15 into the record? Item 15, public hearing on ordinance 0-2024-5, health and safety requirements for short-term rental inspections. Second reading. Ready for a motion? And I'm checking public comment here. No comments on this one, public comment. And I do have one, um, from here in chambers. Mayor Pertem, will you go ahead and make a motion? Mayor Strom, I move. You can come up. You can come up. Yep. Mayor We're Strom, gonna... I move for the adoption of Ordinance 0 2024 5 on second and final reading. Second. All right. With that, we'll open the public hearing. Mr. Haggerty. Yes, I had. Um, I understand that your primary focus here is on the inspection process. Uh, encumbered in that is exactly who's going to be inspected and at what point. Uh, I've had a number of individuals that were aware that the city is very concerned about affordability in terms of housing for many of our members. I noticed when I was reading the summary of what is going to be inspected for, it included such items as egress windows for basement apartments and some other things. And I'm just curious, apparently from what I understand with the new navigation center, the prior occupants were not permitted to continue their occupancy because they did not have sprinklers. I understand that that new center the recovery works, um, has not yet installed sprinklers. So I'm kind of curious how they're able to continue without the sprinklers. But the more important question is for single family residences that currently might be running out rooms, how are those safety standards being applied? And I'll give you three examples. First of all, if 
sprinkler systems are going to be required on the new construction, is that going to apply retroactively to the old homes? Secondly, egress windows and basements are very expensive. They run anywhere from ten dollars to $20,000 per bedroom. Is that required in all new construction? The next question is, is it going to be retroactively applied to all the current areas? Uh, there's one block, 1300 South Chase, for example, where there are probably roughly 25 homes in there, with the exception of two or three. Most of them have basement bedrooms, none of which have egress windows. So once again, from an affordability standpoint, there's a good question here as to how that's going to apply. The third item that I was concerned about is with regard to overall accountability. When we had the Marshall Fire, many of those homes were damaged or destroyed. When they hit a certain percentage, one of the problems they run into is that they then have to bring those up to brand new standards. And if I've got a home, for example, that's had 30 or 40 percent damage, say, from a fire or whatever it might be, and I then have to bring it up to new standards that would include things like egress windows, um, some of the areas are requiring, for example, charging stations for EVs. We also have sprinkler systems, those types of things. All of those things adversely affect affordability, and they could significantly constrain our available housing, especially for lower income individuals. So this is more of a question specifically focused on how is Lakewood approaching that and what are our goals. And I understand the cost for the inspections on an individual basis could have a significant impact as well, because if everybody that rents a bedroom out has to have an inspection and it's going to cost, I'll just say, 100 bucks a year, um, that's going to increase the cost as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Strom and Council. All right, we have a motion and a second on the floor. So a yes vote would be to pass the ordinance as is. And with that, we'll go ahead and have um, open up, open up um, councilor comments. So we have councilor over first. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, what, do we uh, address Max on these questions, or who, who do we ask? Deputy City Manager. Okay. Um, it looks like the main thing that this is doing is adding a second inspecting, uh, inspector inspection company. Um, what are we doing to allow other inspection companies? I, I see this as we were allowing Coke. Now we're going to allow Pepsi. Uh, what about all the? What about RC Cola? What about uh, local providers? Uh, you know, in, in Colorado we have a whole ton of different small-time providers, and if you have just two inspection companies, that means there's zero competition, and they will set prices, and the people that have to pay for this will be paying high prices. And so do we have something in place? Are we looking at something to allow smaller comp other companies, any companies, to, to become inspectors for, the, for us? Well, I'll introduce Director Kirschbaum. Good evening, Max Kirschbaum, Public Works Director. It's not a it's not an issue of the company. It's the it's the issue of the the certification that comes with these two nationally recognized certified agencies. So, it, uh, anyone who holds the certification or meets the qualification of either of these two. Uh, nationally recognized organizations could perform inspections. So we could have 10 out there right now as long as they are could certified. Be. Certainly, as long as they're recognized by one of these two nationally recognized organizations. Councilor Ryan. Yeah, actually, I just wanted to, I think, address uh, Councilor Olver's question. The way I look at the definition of inspector, it, it lists those two organizations or other certified master inspector from a nationally recognized certified body. So what I view this language is not only allowing for another certification body to um, come into being, but we won't have to continually update this every time there's another one. So if the, if the organization says, well, now there's a third one, we won't have to update our ordinance because it gives us that flexibility. 
That's correct. Thank you. I see no others wishing to speak. All right, we'll go ahead and cast your votes, please. And that passes. Ten yeas, zero nays. All right. Thank you, everybody. And with that, we will go ahead and open up um, general public comment. This is the point in the meeting in which you get to come up and speak on something not related to an agenda item. And for this, for again, for those that are watching online, Lakewood Speaks is open and you can make comments on Lakewood Speaks under general public comment tonight and through 10 a.m. this morning, um, as is everybody in the audience. If you would like to do through Lakewood Speaks in lieu of coming up, that you're welcome to do so as well. Um, please, when you come up, um, this is, you'll get times will be, the time will be three minutes. We do have a couple of parties here that wish to pool their time. So with um, four individuals or more can have 10 minutes. So we'll hear from a couple of those this evening as well. And for anyone that's new um, visiting us this evening, this is the opportunity for you to get up and for council to listen to you. If you have questions that you'd like answers to, uh, you can reach out to us via email or by phone. Um, you'll certainly do that tonight if you'd like or you know in the days forthcoming as well. So with that, we'll go ahead and call um, Mr. James Mace. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Council. James Mace, Ward 1. The reason I am up here tonight is I sent all of you a letter on fentanyl via email last week that I personally wrote. Now, I am asking Council to look into this because this is highly, highly making everybody sick. People are dying because of this, Colfax, Sheridan, all over our city, and the people that I work through, we have people in our community that cannot and will not defend themselves. I would really appreciate it if council will take a hard look at this. We need to be leaders. Another thing, Again, this council is not allowing people like myself to speak if we have long agendas. There's so many people that left last week because of the long agenda. This council needs to move public comment up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mace. Mr. Muller. And to let you know who we've got on deck um, after Mr. Muller, Tom Gonzalez and Connie Reddick. Good evening, my public servants. This is Mike from Ward 4. Um, you know, that meeting last week was so, or two weeks ago, was so exciting. Uh, <laughs> it was almost fun. But it, it kind of bothered me tonight. A snowflake walked up to me after, well, during, during the break and threatened me just because of my comments. That's unfortunate. Anyway. Um, 
I wanted to know that you guys made me very popular. As of last week, I had uh, um, 3,400,000 views on TikTok. <laughs> I went viral, <laughs> and YouTube, Facebook, all of them just went crazy. So you made, me, you made me famous. I didn't want to be famous. I have never wanted to be famous. Okay, but I have some questions that need to be cleared up. One, the first one, I applaud the city for not becoming a sanctuary city. And according to the definition of a sanctuary city, is to protect individuals that are being pursued by enforcement of de for deportation for their crimes. Okay, this is very important that people that commit crimes that we give them to the federal authorities, give them to the state authorities. It's for our safety, your safety. This is number. One. This is very very important. We need to continue that service to the feds. Number two. Uh, was that we, we were told that none of the elementary schools were going to become homeless centers. You promised that. And I, the reason why I'm so excited about that is because I live three blocks away from Glennon Heights. That would be very bad for me. Uh, let's see, the next question. Uh, oh, the city agrees that the citizens of Lakewood and... The, uh, at, the, at the navigation center would have a priority. They would be our first priority. Not illegals. The city of Lakewood residents that are homeless. Residents of the United States that are homeless. They have priority. But the number one priority is our veterans. I don't care who's sitting out on the sidewalk, but it better if, if there's a veteran sitting out there, somebody's got to go. It's, it's that simple. Uh, I've also tried to find out uh, how much money we're really going to dump into this thing. How much is a subsidy we're going to dump into this. I haven't heard a number that's, that, that this has come up. I've, I've gotten a number from some people that say next, it's going to be $6 million next year. I think that's ridiculous, but it's got to come out. We've got to have that. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mr. Gonzalez. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Council. I want to thank you for this time. Uh, again, my name is Tom Gonzalez. I have been a resident here in Lakewood for 50 years. Uh, I am on the Board of Appeals. And I came tonight to talk about some issues that concern me and some of the residents in Lakewood. First and foremost, I want to thank the law enforcement for what they do. They do the best they can with what they can. But I was looking up some of the municipality codes that we have. Uh, I'm going to just mention 10 of them. Offense against public peace, uh, disorderly conduct, unlawful, obstructing highway and other passageways, harassment, urinating and defection of, uh, in public, invasion of privacy, window peeping, aggressive uh, beginning behavior, intentional, continuing to solicit, uh, begging in the street, to panhandling. All those things are happening under our nose. Uh, a person almost got hit the other day on Colfax and Wadsworth, running back and forth trying to go ahead and wash a window. The young lady was next to me and she kept telling him no. The guy was so persistent that he went and washed him. Then he went and knocked on her window to go ahead and get uh, some money or something from her. I rolled down my window and I told him to leave her alone, but he still, you know, he, he flipped me off and stuff like that. According to the uh, guidelines and the limits that we have set forth here, they're not supposed to be in the uh, median, 25 feet within a, a walkway, causing problems. They're not supposed to be running across. I went to the police, uh, a policeman that was sitting in Walmart, and they said, oh, we can't do anything because it's their job. Denver is sending them over here because that's part of their uh, treatment for getting work. I don't understand this. I don't understand why Lakewood is allowing our policemen to be handcuffed to do their job. We, we need to go ahead and be a little bit more forceful with this. We need to be a little bit more uh, in tune with what the community needs, not with what 
people that are not even residents of America that come in here and do whatever they want to. And I'm concerned about the safety, especially my wife's safety. Uh, my neighbor has a little baby and she hates to walk the streets now because she can't walk without somebody coming up and asking her for something. And I just need to know what the city council is going to do in the future to secure our freedom and our security and uh, do something about this harassment that's happening on every corner. It's even happening over here on Wadsworth and Alameda now. And I never saw them before. So I'm just asking, what steps are you going to take? And as I was listening to my friend over there talking, it was amazing that I, I watch people. I'm a safety director, and I watch people what they do. The concern and the commitment that you guys have sometimes doesn't show in your affection of what somebody is saying up here. And it's heart-wrenching heart to me to watch you guys not want to pay attention. So I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, Ms. Reddick. Ms. Reddick, and then we have, is it Cafe Bouchel? And then Danny Hunter, and then Carrie Sonnenberg. Good evening, Council. Once again, I'm here to ask you, what are you going to do about my situation? I tried to get uh, used to set up a meeting with me, but uh, now all I have to say to you, uh, there is a higher court, the spiritual court, and what you are doing is wrong. It is wrong because there are laws and the laws apply to me also. Uh, we have a woman here in my ward, Rebecca Stewart, and she's supposed to work with disabled children. Well, what about a disabled elderly person that has been harassed? Uh, my husband was military that took care of all of you. My husband left me with money and with property, but it was stolen but did you do anything about it? No, I called the police and everything, but nobody did anything about it. But now they uh, feel that uh, they're going to make me into a uh, beggar and homeless. I don't think so. All my life I have been the Lord's child and everything that you do to me will come back on you. It'll be a generation curse because the point is I am not asking you for anything but to be treated like everybody else. And when you don't even um, try to meet with me, I have called these people up, even in our building. Uh, now we were, t uh, they broke into our building and broke into my apartment. Uh, now we had a meeting last Thursday and they said there was bed bugs in the building. Uh, and they're supposed to be having a HUD inspection, but they won't let us know uh, who has them or anything. Well, if, if it comes into my apartment and uh, I pay uh, for my clothing and everything else, uh, what are you going to do about it? You are over HUD buildings and over Metro West. You want it to be over that uh, facility, which was a housing authority, and so was Foothills. And nobody has governed or had them uh, follow HUD federal laws. There have been federal laws that you have not even paid attention to what I've been coming in and telling you every single time we have a meeting. We have a district attorney or whatever this attorney is that she hasn't even bothered to fill you in what the laws is. There's a warranty and have a building law, which is a housing law, uh, ADA laws, bullying laws. In fact, uh, in church, uh, we, they brought up about the mean girls. Well, I live in a building that uh, we have the mean 
older elderly women that harass you and I've called the police but nobody has done anything and also about the bullying of the men my dog and I were attacked I have a service dog and I would my hand was bleeding the, my dog's uh, paw was bleeding where he was trying to take care of me also uh, a woman in my building attacked me I called the police she made me bleed but did anybody do anything about it no because they're trying to hide all the Ms. Reddick, I'm sorry, your time is up. Okay. They are not following the laws, and I want you to do something about it, and I want every single one of you to meet with me. And let's get a resolution with this, because everybody's telling me, oh, we can't talk to you. Thank you. Mr. Rob, is it possible to turn the volume up on the timer a little bit? I didn't hear that. Thank you for asking. Look at you already. <laughs> Greetings. Good evening, Lakewood City Council members. My name is Kate Bush. I am 16 years old, and I'm a native of Lakewood in Ward 5. I'm the first speaker for Clean Energy Lakewood. Today, I'm here to speak to you about how caring for our natural environment needs to be our top priority. When I think of Lakewood, I think of the hundred parks, of the clear view of the mountains, of the trees, and of the people enjoying the outdoors. I imagine the people just outside us in Belmar Park. However, the actions we're making today aren't sustainable for a future filled with the same healthy parks. Temperatures are rising, extreme weather is happening more frequently, and wildlife is dying. Urban Colorado is already experiencing effects with our diminishing air quality and wildfires. I remember my entire high school's red noses and coughing during the Canadian wildfires last March. It isn't the everyday person's fault that the environment is failing. The problem is rooted from the policies that the city works by and the infrastructure we've built. As I exit my neighborhood, I'm overwhelmed by the feeling that my city was made for cars and not for bikers and pedestrians like me, and that the groundwork we're building today will be what my generation will be stuck with for the next 50 years. I ask my classmates if they want to bike to school with me, and they reply, it's just not possible. It's too dangerous. With the amount of close calls I faced on my bicycle from unprotected lanes, I can't argue with them. We're constantly building up our reliance on unsustainable resources when our only option is to stop using them entirely. Climate change is the most imminent danger we face yet, but we're reduced to buying the same plastic containers on our food, using the same means of transportation, and supporting the same environmentally degrading corporations. I'm disappointed that despite all of the problems already caused by our unsustainable practices, it's still so difficult to live without inflicting more harm. The only way we can change the environment's downhill course is by making it so that the most environmentally friendly option is the most convenient option. I know your influence is limited, but we rely on you to take our part in reducing the state's carbon dioxide emissions and lead in environmental stewardship for the future of Lakewood. My generation needs our elected officials to take strength and meaningful action to protect our common world. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Danny. Oh. That's me. Mr. Hunter. Good evening, City Council. I'm meteorologist Danny Hunter of Ward 1. I speak on behalf of Clean Energy Lakewood. We are a local group advocating for improving energy efficiency and sustainability in Lakewood. I have so much I want to say, but I'm going to keep it as short as I can. I'm a meteorologist, so of course I have to talk about the weather, the weather and climate a little bit. Last summer, global sea surface temperature and Antarctic sea ice extent were over six standard deviations from the mean. For anyone not well versed in statistics, that is about a one in 13 billion chance, which is the lifetime of our universe. I could list so many climate extremes, like what happened in our own backyard in 2021. Most of you probably remember the Marshall Fire that swept through portions of Superior and Louisville at the end of December, of all months, December. Furthermore, a huge concern for me is the rapid loss of pollinators and the life forms that make up the bottom parts of the food chain, which spell dire consequences for our food supply. Ladies and gentlemen, Earth is a different planet today. 
her vital signs are urgently flashing. And the scariest part is that we'd still be having an ecological disaster without climate change. Yet, it is also this that gives me hope. You see, the discovery of energy-dense fossil fuels allowed us to build cities that are the most energy-consuming humanity has ever seen. Modern cities promoted short-term growth at the expense of long-term sustainability. Buildings were not designed with efficiency in mind because fossil fuel energy was cheap. Greenhouse gas emissions aside, the limited supply of fossil fuels means increasing energy costs for everyone. And our current infrastructure requires too much energy to sustain itself. All in all, the modern city model <coughs> has outlived its usefulness. <clears throat> it cannot solve the very problems it has created. If Lakewood and its residents want to continue to thrive, we have to be more careful with our resources and our decisions. And luckily, we have that power and choice. In a world where more than 50% of people live in urban areas, including Lakewood's own 156,000 residents, cities have tremendous power and influence to innovate. And the benefits are extensive. For example, Localizing and spreading renewable energy production throughout a city keeps tons of money within the city and makes it more resilient. We have the solutions. The world is just lacking in a little bit of political and corporate will. That is what Clean Energy Lakewood is here for, to help guide the action that is so desperately needed and wanted by so many members of the community. You will hear more details shortly. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Hunter. And then we have Carrie Sonnenberg, then Robert Youngsfield, and then Elizabeth Molinar. Okay. Change the order a little bit. You had to keep me on my toes tonight. There's not enough to do that. We had a request to use the overhead camera. Okay. So. Yeah, hang on one second, thanks. Okay. I can start while he restarts the clock. Okay. You might. Yeah, good. go ahead. Uh, good evening, Mayor Strom and City Councilors. I'm Dr. Carrie Sonneborn. I live in Ward 1 and have been involved in the Sustainable Neighborhoods Program since its inception and now Clean Energy Lakewood. The 2022 additions to Lakewood zoning ordinances were modeled after something called the REMP Core Program of Pitkin County that has been successfully improving energy efficiency for over 20 years right here in Colorado. It can be easily duplicated in Lakewood. When discussing this program, I think it's important to give some examples of how the funds, the fee in lieu, collected benefited individuals and the local community in, Lake, in Pitkin County. Colorado Mountain College is a junior college with uh, 11 sites across the Western Slope. The college received funds to do efficiency upgrades at several campuses, including LED lighting, a 95% efficient boiler, and roof insulation. The total project cost was 200,000, of which the core program provided 75,000. Energy savings are estimated at 75,000 kilowatt hours per year and 20,000 therms per year. The resulting carbon savings is 2,500 tons over the lifetime of the project, which is equivalent to taking 520 cars off the road or 225 homes off the grid. These improvements support CMC in their commitment to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. Blue Creek Ranch, a subdivision, was supported by CORE to assist seven single-family affordable homes to achieve high energy efficiency. The first two were designed to be zero energy, super efficient homes. One of the homes, which had solar hot water and PV, won the American Institute of Architects Award in the Colorado West Chapter for Affordable Housing. 
Um, a family of three, mom, dad, and young son, had to replace their boiler shortly after moving into their 1,000 square foot affordable home. Heat, of course, is essential, so the boiler had to be replaced. The couple really wanted to go with higher energy efficiency model to cut utility bills in future. The only issue was the price tag, $6,000, which they did not have. Hence, they applied and qualified for a core rebate that knocked down the price by 25%. Further, CORE connected the couple to a low interest energy efficient loan with a fixed rate of 3.75%. The financing converted the expensive one-time bill into a fairly modest monthly payment that they could handle. It's easy to imagine any of these projects taking place in Lakewood, helping families in the community be more energy efficient. Energy efficiency doesn't just save money on a utility bill, it keeps that money local where it may be spent locally rather than sending it to an out-of-state energy utility. So let's help our local economy by helping our residents and businesses be energy efficient. Thank you very much. Perfect, thank you. Yeah. Robert Youngsfield. Or Neil Priester. Yeah. <laughs> I, I told Neil to come back now that the overhead projector is up. A little bit of a traffic jam there. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Councilors. I'm Robert Youngberg. I live in Ward 4. Moved here in 1991 from Lincoln, Nebraska. And my son uh, went to Green Mountain High School and, and uh, Lakewood uh, Junior High School. I've been very active in renewable energy and, and, and uh, energy conservation since 1978, where I started a uh, energy conservation and solar renewable energy research office at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. At that time, I served on the Lincoln Electric System Board. I, was chair of the City Energy Commission, et cetera, et cetera. Been retired for a while. I'm active in the Colorado Renewable Energy Society, American Solar Energy Society. I'm on the board of the International Solar Energy Society. So I do, that's, that's, that's what I do. I've been at the last four conference of parties in uh, uh, the United Nations uh, Paris Agreement negotiations. The most important thing we can do is uh, don't use energy in the first place as far as conservation. Uh, the global climate, I do a lot of international work, including China, as you, have you, as you noticed, and uh, the, the, the global climate affects us locally. But local work, local activities and local work is really what affects the global, global uh, the climate. And I'm reminded sometimes of Jim Croce and when the song, You Don't Mess Around With Jim, I don't sing it, but uh, it goes something like, don't tug on... Superman's cape and don't spit into the wind. Well, spitting in the wind has immediate blowback, usually, and, uh, but climate change takes a few years. However, it is here, climate change is affecting, affecting us significantly. You're all familiar with the forest fires, the Marshall Fire, economic and climate refugees. We don't live in an atmospheric bubble, let's put it that way. There, we're here talking about, primarily talk about rebates, there are, uh, any number of rebate programs, federal, state, Excel, and we're highly encouraging you uh, to uh, to start matching uh, similar rebates from um, like Denver and Fort Collins and so on. And um, somebody will talk about that in more detail later. On a personal basis, we did a we I bought a home here in Lakewood, another home. <laughs> Uh, about nine years ago, 28 years old, and needed a huge amount of, of, of work. So we did all that, attic, attic insulation, ventilation, sidewall insulation, et cetera, and, we, and a solar system. And uh, we got that, uh, I got a note from Lakewood, from Excel, saying I used 97% less energy than all my neighbors. And it was very economical to, to do all that work. So I'm encouraging you to invest in Lakewood, like uh, some other speakers have talked about. We can save a lot of money, we keep that money in the local economy and, and with economic multipliers, it's really important. And then, uh, of course, here in Lakewood, the city uh, sustainability division uh, is, is going after the, uh, 
the uh, direct payment funds that um, is available through the federal government and uh, the Whitlock Recreation Center looks like we, uh, ex uh, excuse me, City of Lakewood might get as much as $726,000 of that federal money. So thank you very much for your time. Um, if you want to um, get a hold of me and so on, uh, I'm easily available on internet or so so on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry about that. Sorry for the confusion. That's okay. Um, my name is Neil Preister. I live in Ward 1. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, the council mayor. I'm here as, an, as a speaker for um, Clean Energy Colorado. Um, I've been a professional in the, in the uh, housing industry for my whole life. I'm a third generation carpenter. Um, I don't try to boast, but I probably know more about homes than most people have forgotten. Um, my particular home was built in 1941, and as of last year, uh, it is currently zero net energy with a goal of being zero net carbon by the end of the year. And that was not easy, it was not cheap. And I wanted to touch on just a couple things that it took to make that happen. There were a lot of variables. One of them is, is uh, weatherization. Um, with weatherization, the, the, the question always becomes, where's the best money spent? Where's the wise money? Um, Another variation was understanding the innovations in energy efficiency technologies, which are just blowing up. There's a lot of that, and, and you have to be intimate with that to know how to put a project like that together. Um, you have to understand available, available state and federal incentives, because you have to build those into the budgets. It's just not easy. Um, and the greatest variability of all is lifestyles and the people that live in those homes. Those are in combination hard to tackle to, to get a home into zero net energy. Um, now, add the challenge of 42,000 homes and extrapolate that on the level of Lakewood and it, it becomes extremely complex, but there are answers. Um, many of those homes are old. Many of them are, uh, we don't have the resources to scrape them all. We're gonna have to rehab them. Now the reason for that is because Lakewood has committed to achieving zero net community greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. That's zero net community greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. You can do the math. 42,000 homes by 2050, this is a daunting task. But there are answers, there are solutions. We have the tools that we can make that happen. Um, along with those challenges come great opportunities. There are funds available that we can leverage, and we're asking you in advance of the upcoming retreat that you consider our recommendations about looking for matching rebates and additional staff to administer those. We recognize those are hard asks, but they are justified by the hard challenges we face. The opportunities to the Lakewood residents, uh, they, they deserve that. Um, I wanted to touch on a couple things here. Um, this is Denver's program. They cover on a basic overview about um, trying to get more efficient and cooling equipment in your homes. They talk about making it easier to get off natural gas. That's about greenhouse gas emissions. And they talk about improving your, air, your indoor air quality. That's Denver's program. That's their overview. And here are some of their incentives. You can see that those are not trivial incentives and they're covering many segments of home building. Um, they've got air source heat pumps, they've got electrical vehicle char uh, EV chargers, they've got ground source heat pumps, they've got water um, air source heat pumps, they've got heat pump water heaters, they've got solar and they've got battery backup. And again, the numbers are not trivial. Um, those are what it's gonna be needed to, oh, okay. Um, and there's Fort Collins program. Please put, put some money behind this. The Lakewood residents deserve it. Thank you, Mr. Priester. Thanks. Do we have Elizabeth, yep, Elizabeth Molinar and then Laurent Milon? Good evening, City Council and Mayor Strom. I'm Elizabeth Molinar and I live in Ward 1. I'm an anthropologist and conduct research on energy production and consumption and environmental justice. 
I'm an active member of the Sustainable Neighbourhood Network and a citizen advocacy group, Clean Energy Lakewood. As you're about to embark on your retreat, I'm here tonight to ask that City Council put sustainability on their priority list and increase funds in your budget towards sustainability. For about six years, Clean Energy Lakewood has asked the City Council of Lakewood for bigger, bolder steps towards sustainability goals. While Lakewood Sustainability Division does an amazing amount with modest FTEs and funds, the city is still not up to speed with the goals in its own sustainability plan. Meanwhile, current circumstances require even more action than the goals and actions put forward in this, in this plan. Being part of international connections, mandates, and higher government's regulations, we should think of how to make even bigger strides. There is increased attention for sustainability and environmental justice from federal government, state legislation, and county programs. We're part of new regulations, whether we choose to or not. Tonight, you've heard and will hear some suggestions on how to make strides towards more progress, green remodeling, beneficial electrification in existing housing stock, and uh, some other examples. Also, the federal government has money available for this. And we, if we do nothing, that money goes to other cities and residents elsewhere. The finances are very convincing, but there are some other things to consider, like equity, environmental justice, and keeping Lakewood as an attractive place to live, and not just for Californians who can pay cash on a house. Clean energy policies and cutting down greenhouse gas emissions as clean energy Lakewood, Lakewood pushes for will reduce pollution and climate change. Everyone benefits from this, but it is also important for our vulnerable neighbors, as they are disproportionately hit by temperature increases and extreme weather events. Moreover, if we structurally set up matching programs to IRA funds, all income groups can afford smart and sustainable remodeling and doing things in their houses, not merely the higher income groups. Those who would still have trouble affording it could be supported through funds from the fee in lieu in an expansion of the enhanced development menu. And note, IRA funds have equity built into them and are geared towards environmental justice. If the city matches IRA funds, Lakewood's housing stock will be up to date, well insulated, using less or no gas and electricity. This will have economic spin-off effects as people have more money to spend on other items and it will persuade people to stay in Lakewood or settle in Lakewood, especially first-time buyers with modest funds for doing things around their house. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Strom and City Council. I'm Lauren Mayo, resident of Ward 1. For nearly 20 years, we will wrap up for Clean Energy Lakewood after an MBA in new business development and years in corporate executive and consulting work, I've focused my last 15 years on the development <coughs> of the solar industry and renewable energy industries in Colorado, acting in state policy and regulatory and owning a solar installation business, which was based in Lakewood. I sold my business and already have a nearly net zero home, so will not directly benefit from anything we advocate for tonight. We have been asking for a Lakewood energy retrofit program for over six years. Article 13 took care of part one with fees and lieu and new development standards. This was a very large job and we're always impressed with the work of Jonathan Wachtel's team, so he's always doing so much with so little. However, it's time to address part two, giving energy retrofit rebates for the far larger stock of existing buildings and residents in Lakewood. The new unprecedented, stupendously large federal programs resulting from the IRA and other recent federal laws create an incredible opportunity for Lakewood to leverage and attract federal funds to benefit our residents. Uh, many other local jurisdictions have already implemented their own program to complement and attract these funds. Lakewood must feel a sense of urgency to do likewise before the money all flows to more proactive jurisdictions. Our boat is heading for an environmental cliff that will destroy our common home, and we all feel our responsibility in the home we leave our children. We're enthused to see the new council before us, and we believe for the first time in decades we have a council <coughs> who can act as one and truly set meaningful strategy as the captain of the boat and actually turn the boat. Uh, we are meeting with each of you to review things in more detail, yet also wanted to do this more formal introduction in the record and enable staff and all to hear this. We ask that the council pass a very meaningful resolution or two 
to achieve at the very least the first two priorities we've long identified. One, implement a matching rebate program so as to draw the federal rebates into our community before the river all flows to other communities. Matching existing rebate enables quick action with simple administration by relying on the existing well-developed programs administered through the Fed, the state, and the utility. And two, increase the means of the sustainability department. Make it a real department with a chief executive who can negotiate peer-to-peer -peer with other departments. Increase the staff from the current five or so towards the 36 to 40 found in the sustainability departments of similar size cities with similar sustainability goals in the state and majorly increase the budget of the departments to enable funding external contractors as well as local matching rebates. This is needed for goal one as well as for the many other goals like recycling, tree canopy and sustainable transportation. We very much look forward to the result of the eminent uh, strategic uh, council retreat and we're counting on you to act as one to address real strategy on care for our common home without distraction from the urgent uh, flavors of the day. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next we have uh, Lenore Herskovitz. And with that, that is pooled time. So we've got 10 minutes. After that, Jenna Halleck. Is Jenna Halleck still here? Okay. Good evening, Council. Since uh, Lenore Herskovitz War would won. Since the annual planning meeting is only days away, it seems like an appropriate time to look back and see how successful the council has been uh, in achieving its goals that were set last year. And I know half of you weren't on the council last year, but uh, the first goal I'll be talking about is securing inclusive, affordable neighborhoods. The focus, on the, the focus was on the strategic housing plan, which was discussed in a study session at the beginning of the year, and there was one at the end. This is an ongoing process. Additionally, the Housing Policy Commission was going to take up where the defunct development dialogue committee left off in April of 2022, targeting in part affordability and inclusionary zoning. The Housing Policy Commission spent close to a year formulating the short-term rental legislation. Once this passed in March of 2023, they were free to take on other housing issues. Their first meeting was held in May of last year. They had two more meetings that ended in July. There were no more housing policy meetings. A second goal stated that we were seeking short and long-term solutions for the unhoused. There has been some progress in this area with the opening of the Recovery Works Navigation Center and the establishment of an emergency cold weather sheltering program. Obviously, this topic too will be an ongoing challenge for the future. The third and final goal that I'll be talking about tonight relates to effective, accountable, transparent, and data-informed government. Two positives can be noted. The city has hired a communication manager named Angela Ramirez, who has been reaching out on various social media platforms in an effort to keep the public informed about citywide issues. Also, the Lakewood Police Department has uh, begun posting a weekly activity summary called Snapshots of Police Work which includes calls for service, arrests, traffic stops, accidents, et cetera. This has been promoted on Nextdoor, Facebook, and in the Friday report mailing. In spite of these inroads, problems far outweigh any progress that has been made. It is still difficult to navigate websites and additions, be, and ad additions continue to be made frequently. There is confusion between when notification should be on Lakewood.org, the official city site, or on Lakewood Speaks. At last year's annual meeting, a one-stop shop with solution was suggested. It never went anywhere. Now, looking at Lakewood, which is sent to every household in the city, only features one ward per issue. Previously, all wards and counselors had an entry in each mailing. 
This created a, a sense of connectivity between wards. Now that source of information has been removed. We must maintain our monthly ward meetings. Coffee chats and office hours should serve as a supplement, not a replacement for community gatherings. We are constantly hearing from staff that our elected from and from our elected officials how much they value and desire our input. I think the latest buzz phrase is community engagement. Um, we get asked about surveys, studies, the strategic housing policy, and most recently the comprehensive plan, to name but a few. Yet when it comes to turning suggestions and requests into actionable policy, many feel it is an exercise in futility. Even obtaining information on the annual meeting has been difficult. Both our mayor and Councillor Stewart have worked on the planning of this two-day event which will not be recorded for later viewing. You can show up in person or you can wait until notes of the meeting are released. Councillor Stewart told the group at the Ward 3 meeting just two days ago that the agenda and meeting information were available on Lakewood Speaks. Evidently, she had not verified this in advance because the posting was on lakewood.org and no agenda was present. For years, the public has wanted this meeting to be more accessible and transparent. So why would such an important event be held in a venue not conducive to recording? Why should it be the responsibility of community members to try to provide this service? Communications between staff, council members, and the public are insufficient, especially around controversial issues. The city is often reactive instead of proactive, which leads to confusion, anger, and resentment. Too many decisions are made behind the scene by anonymous staff, which fuels the lack of trust. Misinformation runs rampant among community members and within our governing body. There is mixed, there is mixed messaging and blame placing from both sides. Council members have been negligent on following through with requests from last year. The city manager was asked to provide quarterly updates on the established goals. Originally, it was suggested that this be done in person, but that was ignored. The last available update on the city dashboard is from July, a second quarter report. The council needs to provide oversight and hold the city manager accountable when she doesn't fulfill this, uh, her obligation. This would hold true for any job, but especially for someone who is our highest paid city official. You can weigh in on this when the city manager's evaluation comes up in about a month. The broader outlook shows that there were only seven study sessions last year. The calendar allows for an equal number of council meetings and study sessions. The Belmar Peck Park West project highlighted many problems, including the land dedication fee and lieu process. There should have been annual reviews by the Director of Community Resources, Kit Newland, beginning in 2019, not done. The City Council was supposed to review this policy by the end of last year not done, but now scheduled for a study session on April 15th, four and a half months after the expiration date. Interestingly, it only took the city council two weeks this past summer to pass an emergency ordinance to sunset the strategic growth initiative in 2025. This was in response to House Bill 23-1255, which prohibited growth limitations. Although cities were given 24 months to comply, Lakewood passed their ordinance on August 7th, the day before the bill even became law. Neither Boulder nor Golden have taken such drastic action. Lakewood could have simply removed the 1% growth cap and retained the all important oversight portion of the initiative, thereby satisfying both the state requirement and honoring the voters who supported it. To reiterate, this took place within a two week period when 24 months were allotted before a decision were required. 
Yet the fee in lieu, which had a specific immediate deadline, was placed on the back burner for four and a half months. As council members, you have a great responsibility to your constituents. Trust, truth, and transparency are in short supply. We want you to represent our best interests, not your interpretation of them, and respond to our questions. Codes and ordinances need to be followed and enforced. If changes are made, they must be redlined. Appointed city officials should be available for in-person town halls or open forums where they can explain and answer questions about their decisions that have a direct effect on the community. Goals are meaningless without oversight and follow through actions. Hopefully we, you will do better moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Herskovitz. All right, I'm still not seeing Jenna Halleck, so we will move on to Arthur Apples, and we have Scott Wilson, and, Ken, and then Kinley Brunsdale. Mayor Schwamm, Council, thank you for letting me speak tonight. I'm a resident here in uh, Lakewood for the last 50 years. Been in business in Lakewood for probably 45 of that 50 years. And uh, have enjoyed Lakewood as when it was once a fantastic city and a very safe city. Right now, I don't know. Illegal immigration, not asylum seekers. Illegal immigrants, and they are what they are. Flooded with unwanted, needy people I didn't invite here that are here illegally and taking resources, otherwise going to uh, American citizens, homeless, vets, Americans, folks that deserve our first consideration. I contribute to paralyzed vets, disabled vets, wounded warriors, rape crisis, and other worthy charities but it's my decision to who I choose to, to uh, offer charity to and to donate to. Uh, when there's donations that are made to illegal immigrants that are here, not by my invitation, for buying up hotels and so on and spending a lot of money on those kind of folks that were not invited over by me, I don't know, I have a real problem with that. You are financing free rides and resettlement uh, all, uh, plus all expenses paid for this new unwanted flow of illegal uh, in immigrants and entrants into our country. It's repulsive and unacceptable to me. We're not anti-immigrant, we're anti-illegal immigrants, not anti-immigrant. Our country was based and built on immigration and it still functions on legal immigration without question. The threat has gotten so intimidating to my, my wife that unless I accompany her on shopping and running around uh, on more of the main streets and shopping areas of Lakewood, she doesn't really wish to be out on the street of Lakewood alone anymore. How soon are you going to turn our once safe Lakewood into a sanctuary city? My niece was kidnapped uh, not long ago. Actually, she was carjacked at an ATM and forced to drive to a mountain area above Denver where she was raped and robbed and was able to, at 18, almost 19 years old, and was able to keep her cool long enough to talk the assailant who didn't speak much English into driving her back down into the city and letting her go uh, which he did. I don't know where she got that from, that, that kind of courage after just being raped. And uh, she was able to get to a phone and uh, a call uh, for help. And uh, he tried it again. I know I heard the bell. He tried it again about two weeks later to an off-duty uh, police woman at gunpoint, gunpoint um, she shot him dead. 
the fam my brother-in-law and sister were called and the family was notified she was brought down to the the morgue or the police station the morgue for identification and if there was any silver lining with something like that happening she didn't have to go through a trial after all of that drama and so the bottom line was they had found out that she was he was a undocumented immigrant and thus my case is please don't allow us to go to a sanctuary city and allow more of that type of potential. Thank and you, thank Mr. You Apple. Your time. Thank, thank you. you. Scott Wilson. Kinley Burnsdale. And then we'll have Bernie Rufinock and then Regina Hopkins you're up with your pool time mayor uh, council members uh, thank you for the opportunity last Wednesday with a number of uh, uh, Lakewood citizens uh, I attended the uh, planning commission meeting, planning commission meeting here and the purpose of it was to to try to come up with some recommendations for how to improve the process for major site plans so that they could be uh, uh, processed with with more uh, community support and and uh, in the course of that um, we were asking questions and learned that for the past 15 years there has been the opportunity for the staff to engage and involve the Planning Commission to create a forum for the public to know more, to have more input, to participate in an approval process. That opportunity has always been there and there's not one single incidence where it's ever been employed. And that was alarming um, to me. And, and as we explored further in that discussion, we began asking questions. Um, how many how many times has the the uh, director of community resources taken advantage of the discretion that office has to ask for a parkland dedication along with a development, so that we're not in this position of growing, adding more people, adding more population, all of which is putting pressure on an ever shrinking amount of open space and park, and. There was confusion about that, and nobody really knew the answer. And so the purpose of, of my, my speaking today was to, to ask you, as council members, to ask for an analysis by the Office of uh, Community Resources to go back and look over the past 15 years and see how many times, in connection with a major site plan, there has been a, a parkland dedication required or, or at least proposed um, in connection with the development. And so I studied the ordinance, how it's written, how it's designed, and it actually divides properties into two sizes, those that are over 15 acres and those that are under. And so I've put two questions, which simply ask for an analysis and a list. How many were proposed? What happened? And then I've, on the back, I've put lines for council members to join me in making that request. Actually, it's your request. I don't think they would uh, feel too uh, compelled, me alone as a citizen. But I think if this is, is joined by a number of council members, it may carry some weight. And this would be really valuable information for the public. Um, so I'm leaving so uh, 12 copies. Perfect, with the city clerk. And with the clerk, uh, and I also put a recommendation on the bottom for the program going forward, but uh, this is, I'm asking your consideration, consideration of the questions. Thank you. And can you give us your name? My name is Ken Lee Brunsdale. Okay, thank you. thank you. All right, then we have Bernie Rufnuck. Hello, <clears throat> Bernie Rufinock, Ward 3. 
Uh, I was here two weeks ago when, you know, when the inmates tried to run the asylum. But uh, this meeting's been pretty good. But what I would like to see is some changes that to be, you know, run, run this place like a courtroom, you know, and uh, be more, you know, like this meeting was pretty orderly, but in the future it might not stay that way. I think, you know, that it's a really good idea to just not allow phone calls to come in. Uh, people who can't make it can type in their own response. Somebody could get a burner phone and they could make go beyond hate speech even. They could actually make threats against people and groups of people and there would be no way for the law enforcement to trace them. Whereas if they do it online, the law enforcement can often find out who it was. And so I would like to see, you know, a change where there's, you know, just not having the phone calls come in, come in at all. And uh, also <clears throat> to, uh, you know, just maybe, uh, you know, like when, if somebody goes over three, min three minutes, even if I do, I probably won't. I, I'm a, you know, former teacher. But, uh, you know, just disconnect the mic, you know. <laughs> And, uh, you know, you know, really, you know, I, I'd, I'd just like to see it, you know, run, uh, you know, maybe in consultation with the city attorney, I'd like, you know, see, be, be as much Judge Judy as you can be, you know, legally and stuff. But I think we could just, I'd, I'd just say more like a, more, more like a courtroom. Thanks. Thank you. All right. I'm wearing my judge robe next time. <laughs> Okay, Ms. Hopkins, and we have um, also with you Jody Nickerson, Carol McCoy, and Josh Clark. I'm here, Jody Nickerson, I'm getting my time up. Okay, thank you. And Josh Clark and Carol McCoy. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good evening, City Council and Mayor Regina Hopkins, Ward 5. I have 10 minutes, but I won't be needing all of that. Um, I want to share my thoughts on the recent developments within our city, particularly concerning the Belmar Park issue. At the Planning Commission meeting on February 21st, Travis Parker made remarks suggesting a need to maintain the status quo in Lakewood's approach to development, citing the city's stance of maintaining fairness for all developers as paramount. He argued that no property is truly unique, thus justifying a uniform application of his own interpretation of the codes to all site plans. However, this viewpoint neglects the diversity and distinct needs of each project. In his tenure here in Lakewood, Mr. Parker admitted that not a single site plan has ever gone before the Planning Commission, even though the Planning Commission doctrines state that the Planning Commission shall make recommendations to the City Council. To me, this clearly highlights a broken process where decisions are predetermined in this manager-led city. This approach sidelines community input and stifles innovation from a larger body of elected representatives. My ask is for you, our elected representatives, to reclaim some of the authority and challenge the status quo. And if I were in your shoes, I'd also consider reallocating portions of the managerial salaries from Kathy Hodgins and Travis Parker into your compensation encouraging a greater responsibility for our city's future. Furthermore, I wish to address the glaring absence of environmental consciousness in our city's development trajectory. As a lifelong resident, I've witnessed a terrible decline in our community's ecological integrity. The unchecked monster apartment buildings popping up all over Lakewood threatened to erase the few precious areas of high quality habitat remaining for open for wildlife. 
This isn't only a land use battle though. It's a larger narrative of extinction in unfolding before our eyes. Every detail matters, echoing a decline of both avian populations and our own humanity. Science shows that birds aren't singing their morning calls as much and crickets don't make as much noise because they can't be heard in our overly noisy world. I believe the universe is constantly trying to bend towards a higher order. We must continue to move the needle and the arc of humanity. While the arc of the universe is long and I believe it bends towards justice, it doesn't bend on its own. People bend it, and it takes hard work and foresight to avoid catastrophes for our animals and people who want to continue to live their lives too long after we're gone. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have next Mickey Sidivi, Sidivi, then Lenny James, and then Joan Poston. Hi again. Um, I was here last week um, for the the budget or for the um, nine million dollar um, meeting. Um, you know, I, I did want to step back um, and further address comment from the meeting in regard in regards to ordinance zero twenty four dash four. I came in as a concerned parent and my opposition to the nine million dollar grant. I lost my sixteen year old daughter Hannah Elise to fentanyl poisoning. I left the meeting due to council members' remarks that night. I stand back in online, and it was at this time Miss Cruz was speaking. She said she remembered hearing about my child, yet in the same sentence, you used the word addict when addressing um, the gentleman with recovery works and fentanyl addiction. Since I was unable to call in to address this, I emailed Miss Cruz. I was upset, but wanted to be kind, give facts, and honestly thought I'd receive a response. I'm pretty sure that I have not received one to this date. Hannah Elise was not an addict. She died from taking what she thought was a Xanax. It was faked and laced. This is the majority of deaths um, the, the, are, their people are being poisoned and murdered. Hannah did not want to die a deadly mistake. One pill can kill. A major concern with Ordinance 02024-4 is where are the boundary of services? The details weren't explicit with, with what the funds were for. In this case, safe injection over and overdose prevention sites. Uh, State House Bill 23-1202 would have given local governments the power to allow these operations. This bill was only shelved, not killed. These safe injection overdose prevention sites do not belong here and are detrimental to communities. And this was something that I had forgotten the last meeting. Um, but, you know, I, 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 I was offended that my daughter and addicts was used in the same sentence. It did not belong there. Um, and just, you know, just because something is free does not mean it is better for the community as a whole. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Lenny James. Thank you for the opportunity we have as citizens to speak to you. And I've taken that opportunity several times. Tonight, I've brought a picture to show from Varnell's book called The True Story of How Belmar Park Came Into Existence. And what I'd like to show you is, here is the property that 
is in controversy over housing. Here is, are the, is the property across the road that many speak, people have come from to speak to you. This property is roughly the same size that both look, that one might be a little less than the five acres. Okay, there are two places here. This is the property of um, where the conflict is concerning having a four-story building. These are the neighbors across the street that some have spoken to you. And here are 45 patio homes. And what's proposed here is 421 family units in comparison. That's hard. That's really hard. And I appreciated finding Varnell's book and finding about the history of how the park happened. And to see it described as an oasis in the city. It doesn't, it has an area that has commercial things that are there happening, but people in Lakewood can walk into a natural area and be quiet, and that's unusual for a city park, and I appreciate having it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. James. Joan Poston and then Wendy Schrader. Uh, I am Joan Poston and I am a resident of unincorporated Jefferson County. And the previous um, council has seen me many times and I am very appreciative how people are coming and uh, speaking up. It's nice. I have not been here since um, Mayor Wendy Strom has been um, elected and I would like to congratulate her on her um, <clears throat> win and then I'm hoping to see some different kinds of leadership. Um, I'm here to update my FOIA that I originally filed with the General Service Administration, the GSA, on 9-21-21. Uh, uh, most of you do not know what the original FOIA ask was as it involved the manager and the previous mayor. The FOIA was concerning the 57 acres sold in April 2022 with the 15 acres of EPA restricted um, contamination of the land. The GSA, after numerous delays and four director changes, gave me the final report on 12-11-23. Um, there was a filing with the EPA as to a RICO situation, which is a separate issue. I have 90 days to appeal the decision, and that will happen on 3-8-24. I will not be appealing. And um, consulted with a lawyer. This land is not fit for development, and especially for 1,800 units. The energy group that spoke previously here discussed the unhealthy effects of climate change and I sympathize with them. To place children on this contaminated land is sinful. And after Mr. Apple's uh, put, uh, potential poignant testimony, I'd like to remember Lincoln Hope Riley, the student nurse in Georgia that was shot over this weekend by an apparent uh, illegal um, I would like to also suggest that um, when you look at how um, you handle um, public comment, that you follow what they do at the um, county commissioners. They have split their, um, county, their comment period, and they do 30 minutes beforehand, and then they have an after um, period for the rest, 
flow over. I think this would help with some people that have child and transportation issues. Thank you very much and um, have a lovely um, workshop. Thank you, Ms. Poston. Wendy Schrader. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Um, I was here two weeks ago on the 12th to talk with you, and I'm here again. Um, for those of you who might not remember, my husband and I are both Lakewood natives. We believe that Lakewood City Council, the city manager, in this case, deputy city manager, and all of the Lakewood City staff should be focused on the immediate needs of Lakewood residents. Um, since you obviously made a decision that went against what a good number of the speakers had to say on the 12th, and I didn't receive any response to the specific questions that I asked, um, I'm here to ask them again. First, I want to say thank you to Council Members Oliver and Rain because I think they represented us in Ward 4 very well by asking thorough questions. For the rest of you, I don't appreciate the fact that the Mayor and the City Council felt the need to shut down their questions by calling the question to vote without thoroughly hearing all of the questions that they had to ask. Um, again, I'll reiterate my questions are around the ongoing funding for the Navigation Center. How will Lakewood taxpayers um, be certain that this facility will be for the existing homeless? Um, if you've watched the news recently, which I know all of you ha have been, some of you have been on the news, clearly other cities in the surrounding area like Aurora and Colorado Springs are concerned based on the action that they're taking. By Lakewood's inaction, it concerns me greatly of what's going to happen to our city and, and the people that might be coming here for services. Um, the navigation, as in regards to the navigation center, I want to know what exactly is the quote anticipated cost sharing agreements that Mr. Parker refers to in the staff memo. Um, that was never answered as part of that meeting. Um, and then what is Lakewood's ongoing fiscal responsibility? Again, a question that was never answered. Um, Recovery Works uh, estimates $2.5 million per year. So we could be on the hook for quite a bit of money. And this is a city that doesn't have a lot of extra money. Um, I believe that someone, maybe the city manager um, and somebody else that was answering that question said they didn't have the budget book that night. Uh, that's not an acceptable answer in this kind of forum. Um, so I know that you sign in, you leave an email address when you make public comment, and I would expect that you would get some kind of a response when you ask very specific questions. Um, so again, uh, my whole emphasis is Lakewood does not have surplus funds available for operations without cutting into what we're already doing for people who already live here focus on being good neighbors to Lakewood residents and fixing what ails Lakewood because there are plenty of things. And I'd also remind you that this is a really lousy time to do public comment at the end of the meeting. So, and I think several others have said that. So, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Schrader. All right, before we close public comment for the evening, um, do we have any others in chambers that would like to comment this evening? And it looks like we do have one. So if you will stop by with our deputy city clerk, Ms. Salazar right here to sign in. And yes. And um, while he's doing that, just a quick reminder, anybody that's joining us online or in chambers that would like to add a comment to lakewoodspeaks.org, that can be done right now. And for counselors, that will be open until 10 a.m. tomorrow if we could all make sure that we're going in and reviewing those comments.
Greetings. If you could kick us off with your name and ward number or name and address, please. Hello, my name is David Thormansgard and I'm in Ward 3. Um, I didn't prepare very much for what I have to say tonight, so I, I appreciate your grace. Um, but I just wanted to say that I appreciate all that you do trying to take 158,000 people and all of their different ideas of what an ideal Lakewood would be and try to harmonize that and somehow figure out how we can take the limited power that you guys have and move forward to get towards that ideal Lakewood. Um, it's not easy and uh, I, I appreciate that. And part of my ideal Lakewood would be one that is environmentally conscious and energy conscious, encouraging um, more dense development so that maybe people don't need to drive necessarily to work and uh, uses more energy efficient larger buildings right um, it's much easier to heat a large building you have much less losses than a in a single family home um, and uh, one that would support all of its residents so that way if they do fall on hard times there there's a net that will be able to be there to catch them part of which would be the recovery center part of which would be the head start program and um, I appreciate that with the $272 million budget that you guys have that you put that time and that effort into thinking about what are the best ways that we could support uh, all the residents of Lakewood. And uh, it's not an easy job. So I, incur I wish you the best of luck at your uh, retreat and that you'll be able to come to some sort of idea and uh, be able to share that with us. And so uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Thormsgaard. I would imagine our Ward 3 City Councilors will be reporting out after. <laughs> All right, and with that, we'll go ahead and close public comment. Mr. Oh. Tom, I have, I have one more oh, okay. member that signed up. Uh, Flanders Lorton. Thank you. Um, thank you, council members, and sorry for the late comment. That's fine. Um, obviously, I'm here tonight to talk about the ongoing situation in Gaza and Palestine. Um, a few weeks ago, a large number of people came and talked to you all about it, so I think you should be familiar with the situation. The reality is that things have only gotten worse, um, especially with the food situation in the north. 300,000 people are in, experiencing an imminent famine um, despite aid outside the borders not being let in. This is something that should uh, be of critical importance to all of us as our government is continuing to support what's happening in this violence. And I encourage you to all read the news and to inform yourself on what's going on um, in the region and especially to consider again talking about a ceasefire vote. Again, a ceasefire is not taking a side. It is saying that all sides need to stop the violence at all sides, need to release hostages and need to release political prisoners that have not been charged and to allow the free uh, movement of humanitarian aid throughout the region that shouldn't be controversial. Uh, it's simply just to allow people to live and to have the conditions required for life. Um, also, based on some of pe other people's comments, I did want to speak um, on that as well. Um, I understand that some people are not pleased with the large uh, influx of migrants into the city. Um, it does pose lots of logistical and health problems, and I, and I acknowledge that. But I also wonder how many people have actually talked to these people. Um, every Saturday we uh, cook 200 meals for migrants and I've actually helped uh, a family get an apartment uh, here and talk to them uh, and I've, uh, a lot of other families too. I can tell you that these people came here because they were fleeing violence, they were fleeing poverty um, and really all they want is to work. So really the best thing you can do is provide services for them to get work permits and housing because they want to support themselves. They don't want to be a drain on the community. They want to be able to live freely and safely as do everyone else. And um, as far as the harm reduction programs, um, I can say that uh, providing these services are truly going to reduce harm. I don't know the details about um, what is being discussed, but people that uh, do have 
um, addictions and some people that maybe don't have addictions that are getting um, you know, drugs which have fentanyl in them, that's a horrible thing and these harm reduction problems can help with that and by providing services to allow the people that are going to um, do these things anyway to be able to do them in safe ways to prevent overdoses and I do think that that's an important thing. So I just wanted to conclude um, that it is important to care about human life, whether that's migrant life, whether that's uh, Palestinian life, whether that's the lives of our Lakewood city members. Everyone's lives are important. Everyone deserves the conditions required for life and for safety, for food, and for housing. And those are the most important things that we need to address both here and abroad, especially when what's happening abroad is being directly funded by our governments in the US. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll close public comment for real this time. <laughs> Thank you everybody for coming tonight and for engaging and sharing with us your thoughts and your feedback. Uh, we'll go ahead and transition. Actually, we do not actually have anything to talk about on general business today, nor do we have an executive report. So we'll skip ahead to our council reports. And with that, I'd like to start with Ward 1. So, All right. Thank you, Mayor. Um, as you've heard, we have a retreat coming this weekend. And as such, then we will not have the ward meeting this Saturday, Saturday the 2nd. And so in its place, we will have a coffee at Ziggy's on March 8th. It's a Friday. And so we welcome you all to come and, and have coffee with us. And just a heads up, because of another scheduling conflict in April, we will also, um, we will be combining some constituents have said, hey, how about let's combine our ward meetings, and so we'll combine with Ward 2 in April, and that'll be April 20th, but that'll also, of course, be posted on the website, but it's a just a sneak peek right now. One thing that I wanted to highlight that I took advantage of uh, is um, the Colorado Auto Theft Prevention program that the Lakewood City Police has going. And so what they do is provides you with free tools to help prevent auto theft. So you can go online to the um, City of Lakewood and then the police and then again put in Colorado Auto Theft Prevention or whatever you want to put in. Anyway, um, they give you tags. And so if a vehicle is stolen, it you can recover it faster because it has a tag. But of course, um, prevention is always good and they do provide you with a club. And so um, Lakewood is making all of that free for you. It's free. And so just go and make an appointment and take advantage of this great opportunity. That ends my report. Um, yes, thank you. I just wanted to add a, a couple of things. I wanted to recognize uh, the South of Six uh, Sustainable Neighborhood Group in partnership with the Mid Lakewood Civic Association hosted a meeting on the comprehensive plan, as did Sustainable Iber on uh, February 9th. So great opportunity in Ward 1 to discuss the comp plan and, and help inform that process and, and just highlighting that this is an opportunity. If you have a neighborhood association or a neighborhood group, please reach out um, for more information. And that Sustainable Applewood is hosting a seed giveaway on um, March 9th. And this weekend, I hope everyone's marked their calendar, it's the tree sale for the city of Lakewood. $25 per tree, three trees available per household. But you do need to be registered on lakewood.org. So thank you. And that's it for Ward 1. Ward 2. Fantastic. Um, so I want to thank everybody who came to our ward meeting not this last weekend, but the weekend before, the President's Day weekend. We had a great turnout, and in fact, definitely our room was too full. So we're working with the Clement Center, who, is, who graciously has hosted ward meetings for Ward 2 for 
uh, many years, as, as long as I've ever gone to them. And I, my first one, I think, was 2014 So um, that I attended. I was obviously not elected. So we are working with them to get a bigger room for next time. So if you were claustrophobic, don't worry. We're going to get you space. But we had a great conversation that was centered around the comp plan. Um, and then I know that Two Creeks Neighborhood Association, their next meeting will also have comp plan um, input opportunity. Um, and then the Sustainable Morse Park Neighborhood Association has really become um, more regular again. There was sort of a lull in the Morse Park area of neighborhood engagement, either sustainable or otherwise. Um, and so just really excited to see that come back up and you can find more information on the sustainable neighborhoods part of our webpage, um, but they also have a Facebook where they post everything, Morse Park Sustainable Neighborhood, and their next meeting um, is March 5th. Thank you, Councillor Cruz. <laughs> um, and they're going to be specifically talking about bike and pedestrian connectivity and safety in the Morse Park area, if you're interested in that conversation. Um, we do have a retreat this weekend, which people have talked about. I have heard from many, both within ward meetings, phone calls, emails. I really appreciate the amount of community response and input that I have gotten to receive from folks. And there's a lot of the same themes that we have seen, um, you know, housing, homeless folks, uh, sustainability are things that continue to come up. Uh, I will say that they continue to get more specific. As I think was mentioned uh, in one of the public comments today, we have put together a lot of programs and new, new infrastructure, uh, like social infrastructure, bureaucratic infrastructure on a lot of those issues over the last few years in the city. And so we are now in a place where we are able to really uh, innovate on some of these questions. We're able to be able to move forward um, because we have put together those nuts and bolts and the staff of the, of the city of Lakewood have put together some of those nuts and bolts to allow that kind of programming to happen, which is great. And so really looking forward to those conversations. And if you haven't yet emailed or called uh, your city council person about what you're hoping our priorities are, please make sure that you do that. Um, Next is Friday is First Friday for 40 West Arts District, which should be delightful, perhaps snowy this time, um, even though I think the last one was sunny. So, uh, you know, Colorado weather, but I encourage everybody to come out. There's a lot of really cool exhibits uh, that have just opened recently, and it's promising to be a really great First Friday. And I will turn it to my co-counselor. Thank you. Yes. Um, I think the Casa Bonita exhibit at uh, Next Gallery is still up this first Friday. Uh, it's really cool if you haven't seen it. Um, would recommend. Um, also just uh, wanted to highlight for our next Ward 2 meeting that will be on uh, March 16th at 2.30 p.m. at the Clement Center. We'll see you there in a bigger room as um, my co-counselor mentioned. Um, also just wanted to highlight um, the West Colfax Community Association has another um, call to action this month. Um, they are um, looking for donations of shelf-stable, ready-to-eat food and carrying bags um, that will be donated to the Action Center. Um, that they're accepting that on, until March 20th at the Hub. Um, so you can go to First Friday and drop off some items for people in need in our community. Uh, and um, yeah, and looking forward to that uh, sustainable Morse Park um, meeting as well. And uh, also just wanted to um, address uh, Ms. Davies' comments. Thank you so much for your accountability with my email. Uh, please accept my apologies for that insinuation. That certainly not was not my intention, but I understand that it caused that impact. So I look forward to replying to your email. Ward 3. I don't have much, but I just wanted to thank the community who showed up to our ward meeting at a little bit of a different time. We had a really nice, robust conversation about the comp plan as well. So really excited and thanks to residents who have filled out that survey already. Really excited to dig in on that. The only thing that I have outside of our retreat, which I'm very excited about uh, this weekend, should be productive, is that the next Saturday, March 9th from 12 to 5 p.m is the Blarney on Belmar St. Patrick's Day celebration at the Belmar Plaza. Uh, it should be a fun time, lots of music, lots of uh, good things happening in our wonderful downtown, which also happens to be in Ward 3. So. 
thank you. Uh, I was going to mention something about Blarney on, on Belmar, uh, but but Councillor Stewart uh, did such a good job summarizing it. I'll just second that and say, uh, hope to see you there March 9th, 12 to 5. Should be a good time. Wear green. I don't know if I have anything green, but I'll have to find something. Um, our board meeting last Saturday was was a good discussion. Thanks so much to everyone that, that showed up. Um, we heard quite a bit about the comprehensive plan, um, so I just want to shout out, uh, be sure to fill that out. You can, I think the deadline for that is the end of February. Um, Lakewood.org backslash Envision Lakewood 2040. Um, we heard a good bit about the comprehensive plan process at that ward meeting and, and about how folks can participate in that. Um, so uh, yeah, participate in the comprehensive plan. Um, a couple, there were just a couple comments um, uh, speaking about the NAV Center. Uh, the, the, the things that folks said were not addressed really were addressed in the last council meeting. I encourage folks to go back if, if you want, for instance, to see the budgetary impacts that was discussed in quite a bit of detail at the meeting that was held on February 12th. Um, for instance, at timestamp 405, there was a robust discussion with Mr. Parker on the budgetary impacts of that NAV Center. So I'm not going to repeat. I, I spoke, I went on at, at too much length last, uh, last meeting, but um, that was covered in some detail. I just wanted to say one other thing, um, and we, we didn't do council comment two weeks ago, so I, I didn't get to this. You know, the, watching the discussion that's played out in our city over the last month on the topic of migrant has called to mind for me that, that old adage that a lie has time to travel around the world before the truth has time to put on its shoes and, and tie its shoelaces, or something to that effect. I just wanted to remind everyone briefly what actually happened. Um, we asked our city manager to have a meeting with the city of Denver, which she did. She reported back, and we asked her to do that because we thought this was a regional priority, and it is a regional priority, as I think the outpouring of interest from the community has confirmed. I don't mind at all fielding you know, concerns, comments, thoughts from, from the many folks who have reached out. I was, I was very happy to, to reply to those, those, those inquiries. And you know, it, it, it is a, a live, important issue. But I really do take issue with a handful of people who I think have deliberately spread misinformation and deliberately suggested that we are doing things that we are not doing. So just one more time, we are not suggesting that Lakewood should become a sanctuary city. We are not suggesting that we should open up Lakewood schools to a bunch of migrants. We are not suggesting that folks from Denver come into Lakewood. That none of those, none of that's true. And I'm not going to name names, but you know, this was extensively reported on by independent investigative journalists. Look up some of Kyle Clark's reports on this. He'll tell you exactly who was behind some of these rumors. There's one thing that I, I did um, that I, I would encourage folks to do. Um, if you go to lakewood.org, Mike backslash migrant information, where there is a readout of that meeting, and you can, again, confirm all the things that Lakewood is not doing and a readout of the meeting that the city manager has now had, there are also links to organizations and opportunities to donate. I made a personal decision as a citizen of Lakewood to donate my last city council paycheck to the Newcomers Fund, which is hosted by the Rose Foundation, which is on that page. And it's an opportunity, it's, it's an important fund that is providing support to desperately, you know, to, to thousands of families that are coming into the broader community who desperately need support. And I would just encourage us all, as we talk through these immensely complicated, nuanced issues, um, to just try to lead a little bit with compassion. Um, I, I, I've just said all the things that Lakewood is not doing. But I do think that um, as individuals, we could all do more to, to help these folks that are coming to our community. And I hope other folks listening to this, I don't know how many folks actually listen to the council comments at the end of the meeting, but if you're listening, I encourage you to go to lakewood.org backslash migrant information and consider making an individual donation to the Newcomers Fund or volunteer or donate to any of the other links that are set forth there. I know Lakewood is a compassionate community. I know we care about our neighbors and our, our Lakewood residents and folks who are in our community who are desperately in need. And I would encourage folks to go and, and consider chipping in something to help these families. Um, and I would encourage us all to lead with a little bit of compassion on this issue. Um, and I think that's all I have to say. All right, Ward 4. Thank you, Mayor. 
uh, I wasn't going to bring this up, <laughs> but I feel I must defend some of the people that came in here before. I, I feel that this that issue and the misinformation was a little bit of a self-inflicted wound on our part, on Lakewood and Council's part. Uh, did they run with it? Yeah, <laughs> they definitely did. Um, but okay, two things happened, at least two, I think three. One was our city manager said that w Lakewood was interested in buying Emory School. Uh, and, and that school is for sale. And so the people heard that Lakewood is interested in buying one of the schools that Jeff Co or one of the schools that Jeff Coast Schools is surplusing. So, uh, and also they heard that the Action Center was interested in buying the building. Or there, there was just some rumors about that. It was like the Action Center, which takes care of, uh, provides uh, it's a food bank and a clothing bank for the poor. And so that they put those two things together and said, uh oh. Uh, are, are we going to be providing housing for poor people or, or homeless? And, and it could have been corrected real easily because it's my understanding that all Lakewood was interested in was the ballparks. And if we had said that out loud, everybody would have got, got understood that we were not interested in buying that school for homeless. And of course, I. You know, um, a gentleman was talking about living next to Glennon Heights tonight, and so like I was chasing that one down and the Green Mountain Elementary School because there's two schools, elementary schools that have been closed in Ward 4, and so I've been hearing a lot of things about those two. And so I was chasing that down, talking to our planning director, talking to other people on staff, trying to make sure we weren't talking about buying those schools, and we're not. And we're not talking about uh, putting homeless in any of those. But I can see where it came from uh, because of the original vague information. And, th and the other part of that, of course, is the motion that was passed here uh, to talk to Denver about being a good neighbor. Nothing wrong with that at all, unless you look at the language of that motion, which included all feasible means. And all feasible means could mean things like busing people out here. Uh, and so it was the language itself. I mean, you add those things together, and then some people just ran with that idea. And, and that's where the misunderstanding came from. It's not a bunch of racists or anything like that. It's just that we gave some information and not, not complete information, and so then they they ran with it, and I have no idea where the sanctuary city came, part came from. <laughs> it, we are not officially a sanctuary city, and we're not talking about being officially a sanctuary city. Um, and I'm going to leave it there at that. Um, moving on, uh, I, I'm not going to be reading the public comments from this meeting tomorrow morning. Uh, it closes, you said, at 10 o'clock. I found that our public comments are becoming worse than next door, um, <laughs> and I'm not lying about that. Uh, I just looked at them tonight, and um, people are not identifying themselves. The one comment came in from a Jewish woman, one came in uh, from a human in Lakewood, another one comes in from an actual citizen. Uh, the human in Lakewood then started talking about the merry band of racists of the person you were talking about before. And, you know, and, and I've seen more going back a couple of years. I've seen different counselors be insulted on there. I've been insulted on there. Um, John Klaus called me an utter buffoon, which I thought was a very clever little insult a long time ago. But I thought we should have been doing something up for our counselors so that that kind of stuff doesn't um, continue. Um, and perhaps we're gonna talk about this during the retreat, but we really need to clean up our liquid speak so it's not, doesn't become next door. Um, and final thing, I do have a, a question for Mr. Goldstein. Uh, we've been hearing about the window washers on uh, Colfax and Alameda and Colfax and Wadsworth. And tonight we heard from a man who said that uh, he went and talked to the police and the police said, we can't do anything, our hands are tied or, or we're handcuffed. Is that true? 
Could our police do something about that? I think there's a couple things. Uh, it's a resource issue. So there are lots of street corners in the city of Lakewood and not that many police agents. Um, we can have the police department put together a report so that you all can better understand the complexity of it, but it is a complex issue. But they could do something. In, in other words, when he said that the, the officer told him he couldn't do anything, that's not actually true. Our, our officers can do something. I think it would be circumstantial to, to see what specifically was occurring at what street corner, what safety concerns might be at play, but likely the police could figure out something, but it's best to let the police address that and perhaps a written report to council. Okay, that'd be all right. Thank you, that's all I have. Just to follow up the police comment, uh, we're having a conversation with each other. Uh, I have put a request in and have had a chance to talk to the police chief and so we can talk a little bit more about that uh, a little bit and hopefully we can have an opportunity to have further discussions at the retreat, which brings us to the retreat. I know it's just a couple of days and to the extent someone's listening to us uh, or looks, re, uh, listens to us on a recording, if you do have thoughts as to what you think your, the priority should be uh, of Lakewood, email us. We would love to hear any and all civil comments again don't yell at us uh, no all caps but uh, respectful thoughts as to what we might actually do and we heard some great conversations uh, in, in public comment this evening on what we might be able to do and and i very much enjoy the fact that people have taken the time to enjoy i very much appreciate that folks have put in a lot of time and thought as to what we might do to make our city a better place to be and so keep those comments coming uh, we, uh, uh, and just to transition to, we've had great comments. Uh, we had a coffee on the 20th uh, and uh, uh, we had almost too much of a good thing. So we have to find another location because we overwhelmed the barista with 40 to 60 or however many people we, we had uh, at our coffee. We, we are still having individual coffee. So if you do want to sit down and talk and have coffee, um, I did that this morning. We've had a few others uh, as well sprinkled through, but not these grand coffees that are overwhelming our poor baristas. Uh, we'll probably stick to ward meetings for right now. We're tentatively scheduling one for March 20th, but we need to lock down the date and all that before we formalize that. So we haven't forgotten about the ward meetings. We'll continue to have them. Uh, we had a great one in, in January that we had to move to a gym uh, because we had so much of wonderful turnout. So that's it. Ward five. All right, thank you. Um, we also had a, a good turnout for our ward meeting on the 17th. And um, I would like to, and I have to coordinate with my counterpart here um, on the next date because we have some conflicts coming up, but I would like to get more input from people on what they would like to see in upcoming ward meetings. One of the things I'm putting together is a uh, a presentation on xeriscaping and the way that we can conserve water better um, individually. And I think there's a lot to be said about climate change and things that we can be doing as a city to help facilitate saving energy and saving water. Um, however, individually, we all can be doing um, things to mitigate climate change and to improve what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis that will help overall. Um, so again, I would encourage everyone to pay attention to those things and um, consider what you can do individually to conserve water and energy um, going forward. The, um, I, heard, I heard a number of people, and I, I did want to comment on the tree sale, so I'm glad it, that was covered well. I would encourage everybody, if you have the land um, or the property to plant a tree, please do so. We desperately need more trees. We are woefully short on our tree canopy goal, and I think we all recognize that our air quality is um, on the decline, and that is going to impact all of us. Um, t two words that I heard thrown out here several times tonight was grace and compassion, um, and I think that's essential for all of us as a community to, to not look down your nose at someone else or not um, criticize someone else for maybe the, where they are in life and, and to 
alternatively look at how you can help them and how you can encourage others. Um, and I also would ask um, that, you know, we have a lot of new people on the council, me being two weeks into the job. Um, I am encouraged by the energy, the enthusiasm, the optimism, and the ideas of this council. So please give us an opportunity to follow through on some of those things and to come up with a new direction and new leadership um, so that we can move forward in a more positive manner than maybe pre previously was seen. But give us that grace, give us that opportunity to make some positive changes. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nystrom. Thank you, everybody. I um, want to start off by sending a huge congratulations out to the Porch Light Family Justice Center that just celebrated their third anniversary. Um, we are very fortunate. This is actually a center that was the brainchild of our district attorney's office, and we were very lucky to have right here in the heart of Lakewood. It provides not only you know tangible must need things for victims of domestic violence, survivors of domestic violence, and their children. But it's an amazing place that welcomes them, whether they have a cat, a dog, or a fish. They do their hair. They can do medical exams right there so that a woman doesn't have to go to the hospital in one of the most painful, very traumatic situations in her life. And I just, I cannot say enough how grateful I am that Porch Light is in our community. So I take, you know, give everybody, um, please you know, look into it, that it is also a nonprofit. We've got lots of nonprofits with needs. Um, this is a very, very amazing one that I'm, you know, we just, we couldn't be for more fortunate to have here in Lakewood. I want to say a huge shout out and thank you to our Lakewood Police Department um, for the registration roundup that has been going on. That is one thing that us as city councilors hear probably pretty regularly is frustration that this person or that person in front of us has an expired tag on their car or no tag at all. And they have been very serious, and darn it, I had pulled up a, po a Facebook post that had numbers, but the amount of citations that they have issued this month on that one thing has been um, just very heartwarming for those of us that have been frustrated by seeing these on the road. So thank you so much for Lakewood PD. Um, I won't spend much time on the retreat. We do, you know, that was brought up tonight. We do have that coming up on Friday and Saturday. Friday is going to be really more focused on how we as a city council can um, improve what we do. Uh, so more logistical speaking, looking at policies and procedures, the running of the meeting, the things like that. Um, for those of you that would prefer to get uh, a little bit more of a taste of what we're looking at strategically as far as our goals moving forward, whether it be you know, sustainability, affordable housing, um, transparent government, data-driven, all those things, we'll be talking, getting deeper on that on Saturday. So invite everybody to join us. The Lakewood Cultural, no, sorry, Lakewood Heritage Center is where we will be in the Orchard Room. Uh, there will be space in there for observation by the public. Uh, it is not, it is a workshop setting, so it's not something where public input will be part of it, but welcome you to um, not only reach out to your counselors to share what's important to you, but also to, um, you know, come listen, see the good work that we're really trying to do. Uh, and then I do want to make, I've had a, a couple of questions about um, a letter that I signed on to recently through the Metro Mayor's Caucus. So I wanted to take just a minute to give a little bit more information about that. You know, um, back to actually Councillor Over, thank you for your verbiage that we, you know, the of the original um, verbiage of the request for the Lakewood, you know, the city manager as she was meeting with Denver learning about the migrant crisis, learning about what we can do. That was something that also helped me open my eyes to other opportunities that we can do that don't cost money. We have a need that is impacting our region, that is impacting our city. Several people got up here tonight frustrated about car wash or window washing in intersections. It is uncomfortable. I've sat in those intersections too. Um, we've also gotten complaints about f folks that are at Home Depot or, you know, name the other store that, that it's going on. So 
whether we as a, a collective or certain individuals in this community want to help the immigrants that are here, whether or not they're here. So we really need to figure out what are our best options to try to make sure that the needs of our residents are still being met. Right now, we have nonprofits that are being overwhelmed by our own homeless needs and our own needing to meet the needs of food in our community. We're also starting to get a lot of conflict that's coming with migrants that are being here. We can't ignore this. So I know that it created a lot of drama by us having these conversations, but as a planner for a living, I do think it was fundamentally important for us to look at the need, look at what was going on in our community. I'll be honest, I've been worried that Lakewood would send a bus without us knowing. This gave us the opportunity to learn, or I'm sorry, Denver, this gave us the opportunity to learn from Denver that they weren't intending to do that. So um, one of the things that I took incumbent upon myself was to um, have conversations with the Metro Mayor's Caucus. I just want to take a minute to, to fill you in because it's not something that we typically talk about. And I don't remember Mayor Paul mentioning this much, but it's an organization that was actually founded in 1933. And it's actually a nationally recognized volunteer membership organizations for members around or mayors around the Denver region. It's actually 38 communities that make up the Denver metro area. And they work collaboratively to identify common challenges as well as solutions that, uh, that are for our region, but also for our member municipalities. One of those core functions is developing consensus solutions to regional issues and advocating for their implementation. In fact, a fundamental strength of the Metro Mayor's Caucus is actually the ability to speak with one voice on behalf of many mayors. Many times that's actually used as a collective voice to support or not support bills that are being proposed in our local state legislature. But earlier this year, it was via a collective voice that was used to advocate for addressing the crisis of the influx of migrants that's not only affecting Denver, but as I mentioned, it is here in Lakewood, it's our entire metro region. So while Denver is currently bearing the brunt of the crisis here in Colorado, the communities of the Metro Mayor's Caucus, seeing how it was impacting all of our communities as well, worked to lend our support to amplify the voice of the requests of Denver's Mayor, Mike Johnston. We did this through a letter that was created collaboratively by the group and submitted to our federal legislators. It was an honor to be part of that process. And in my short tenure as a mayor, I'm very enthusiastic to have such a passionate group. And I'll add bipartisan group. We have several mayors, both sides of the aisle, probably some that are in the middle. Um, but we all come together collectively to have these conversations. In fact, Mayor Kaufman of Aurora was very actively part of the, the crafting of this letter as well. So I just want to make sure that everybody understands a little bit behind the intention of that. And um, you know, there is some question as to who signed the letter or who didn't sign the letter. But I will say um, you know, very emphatically that this was something that I was passionate about being a part of. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity to have done so. And I do hope that it helps amplify the voices coming from the Denver metro area as we have, um, we have received more per capita of the immigrants that are coming over the border. And a lot of that really is an $89 ticket from El Paso. It's that easy. And it's unfortunate that we're having this situation where so many of our nonprofits are struggling and we've got residents in our community that are uncomfortable. I get it. But I want to make sure that everybody understands that we're all here. We want to meet you where, we, where you are. We understand that everybody cares and wants to do things a little bit differently. And we're trying very hard to thread that needle to, needle to make sure that we're doing the best that we can as your elected leaders. So just want to bring that up. And with that, um, I'll go ahead and close the meeting.